check, check. Hi, everyone. I'm just testing the mic. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Good? Yeah? Welcome to the Capacity Building Hub. Julian, can you hear me at all? Or is it too? Can you hear me fine? Is it loud enough on the screen? OK, great. Thanks.
morning to everyone. Uh, can you hear it to me? Yeah? Excellent. So I would like to welcome everyone joining today. My name is Jairo Akopian. As a member of the Paris Committee on Capacity Building, I would like to welcome you uh, to the second day of the Capacity Building Hub here at COP27. Today's team is implementing Articles 16 and 13 of the Paris Agreement Day. So as you, most of you might know, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement consists of nine paragraphs providing principles for how countries can pursue voluntary cooperation to reach their climate targets. These high-level principles were intended as a basis for countries to develop uh, detailed rules on how to implement Article 6 in practice. However, they have been contentious, leading to years of delays. Article 6 has three operative paragraphs, two of which relate to carbon markets. Article 6.2 provides an accounting framework for international cooperation, such as linking the emission trading schemes of two or more countries. Article 6.4 establishes as a central UN mechanism to create credits from emission reductions generated to specific projects. And Article 6.8 establishes a work program for non-market approaches, such as playing applying taxes to discourage emissions. At COP26 in Glasgow in 2021, following several years of inconclusive negotiations, countries agreed on a package of rules to govern and implement international carbon market mechanism under UNFCCC. At COP26, nations reached new agreements for market mechanism. Essentially, supporting the transfer of emission reductions between countries while also incentivizing the private sector to invest in climate-friendly solutions. Simultaneously, parties decided on non-market approaches enabling stronger cooperation between countries on mitigation adaptation. While that's on Article 6, Article 13 of the Paris Agreement established an enhanced transparency framework for action and support with built-in flexibility which takes into account parties, different capacities, and builds upon collective experience. The transparency framework under the Articles 13 of the Paris Agreement further enhances existing arrangements in which commitments and actions were measurable, reporting, and verifiable, MRV. At the same time, reporting and review requirements under the Paris Agreement include provisions on information on the use of cooperative approaches towards the implementation and achievement of parties' nationally determined contributions. The reporting of such information cuts across Article 13 and Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. We are here at COP27, together for implementation. That being said, through the event today, we look at how the outcomes of Glasgow with regards to Article 6 and 13 can be moved to implementation and the role that capacity building plays in this context. At the four capacity building hub, we have taken in this opportunity to amplify the importance of implementation with a variety of speakers and organizations. But before we dive into events of today, we let me introduce you the Capacity Committee on, capac uh, on Capacity Building. Established at COP21 in 2015, the PCCB seeks to address current and emerging gaps and needs in implementing and further enhancing capacity building in developing countries. To support the PCCP's mission and mandate, the committee launched the PCCP network in 2020 as a voluntary association of interested stakeholders engaged in climate-related capacity building. Yesterday, at the opening day, we also ex uh, explored the role of networks in collective capacity building. The PCCP regularly mobilizes the expertise of its network members at the regional level through PCCP side events at the UNFCCC Regional Climate Weeks through regular webinars and events throughout the year, but also at the international level through Capacity Building Hub at COPS. The Capacity Building Hub is a mandated event of the PCCB and takes place each year at COP with this year as the fourth hub to take place. Its, ob its objective ultimately is to showcase the variety of capacity building efforts which have taken place over the year by sharing information, experiences, and technical capacity to further climate action on a larger scale. To learn about the PCCP and its network, make sure to check out two banners with 
QR codes that will redirect you to our web pages, which will give you more inf information. And last but not least, throughout the year, organizers ranging from Commonwealth, GIZ, and BMWK to Junto is uh, ICAT, FAO, and Minister of Environment for Peru will be bringing together their wide range of knowledge and experience implementing the Paris Agreement, which, as we know, is the, the, is the key objective for this year's COP. I would like to give a hearty thanks to the Global Green Growth Institute for leading the organization of today's events, and we finally like to hand the floor over to GGGI, who will be providing some more information on the day's objectives and events. Please. Thank you very much, Cairo. Uh, uh, my name is Inger Solvang, and I am Deputy Director, Head of Climate Action and Inclusive Development at GGGI, or the Global Green Growth Institute. We are in a treaty-based intergovernmental organization with headquarters in Seoul, South Korea. And we have 44 members currently and operations in 39 developing countries and emerging economies. And we have a great interest in the topic today, which I think has been so well laid out by Jairo that I will not repeat too much of what was just said in terms of setting the scene for today. Um, but clearly, um, transparency, Article 6, uh, MRV, and all things related is the backbone of the Paris Agreement, and hence also the backbone of what GGGI does to support our members uh, on developing of, of climate instruments, green growth plans, uh, development of a regulatory framework that enables uh, ambitious climate action and adaptation, both mitigation and adaptation, and then also moving along that value chain of implementation towards bankable projects and ultimately mobilization of green climate finance. Um, so transparency is without a doubt really one of the most important things that we engage in, and perhaps also one of the, the most complex and complicated issues as well. Uh, so the need for a capacity day on Article 13 and transparency is clearly very much welcomed by GGGI and also by our members. Um, so, um, so that's, um, uh, that's uh, uh, a reason why we have also expressed so much interest in, in helping organizing today's events. Now also on Article 6, uh, GGGI is one of the front-running countries in terms of trying and testing the rule book that was uh, finalized at COP26, mu much awaited and finalized in, uh, at, in Glasgow. Um, now we are still trying out its definitions, as you know, and I'm sure you are also engaged in the same, trying to figure out what are the approaches and the tools that that are most helpful in, in terms of, of achieving the objectives of Article 6. Uh, those are articles that may stand alone, Article 13 and, and Article 6, in, 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 in terms of sort of this how, we, how we discuss them, but they are inherently linked and, in, and integrated and interconnected. So that's also why we think it's very useful to have a day today focusing on both Article 6 and Article 13, because without transparency and without MRV and the ability to really monitor the impact of climate action, there is no engagement on carbon, carbon markets and, and the other elements of, of international cooperation under, under Article 6. So we find that very, very useful. Um, now, um, just uh, to highlight the agenda, and as you can see, we now have the agenda on the screen. I hope you can see it. It's a little bit uh, small writing, but hopefully you can you can see it. Uh, we just want to highlight um, uh, the events that are mostly focused on transparency today uh, is the one that we will start already now at 10 o'clock, which is very exciting. It's uh, by the UNFCCC Secretariat, a part which is part of the two-week Together for Transparency initiative that will cover raising media awareness about the role of transparency in the architecture of the Paris Agreement. And the session is titled Understanding and Communicating Transparency, the Role of the Med Media. So um, that's uh, an example of a stakeholder uh, in that, that requires capacity, the media. So we hope that we will have 
great media presence in the room for, the, for that session. Um, now they will be showcasing relevant sources of climate information and data and discuss the role of the media in communicating climate transparency matters as well as um, the dif different regional perspectives, challenges, constraints and ways forward. Uh, now at 12.20, also related to Article 6, uh, oh sorry, Article 13 primarily, the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI, uh, session will look into the urgent capacity building needs for implementation of the enhanced transparency framework. Um, and the session will also tackle various layers of capacity of uh, both individuals and national institutions. Uh, so it will be a round table on lessons learned from LP-led, also delivered for the government of Ethiopia, as well as capacity knowledge pro uh, products focused on developing MRV systems in Burkina Faso. Um, so uh, that's the session at 12.20. Uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon, we have the Commonwealth uh, sharing their experience of bringing the youth into forays of Paris transparency, uh, their Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Team has launched an action-oriented task group with CSEF youth under the Commonwealth Youth for Sustainable Urbanization Network to facilitate a greater participation of youth across the Commonwealth in energy transition. And then at 10 past three, also linked to Article 13, is the session called Transparency in Agriculture and Land Use, Learning from Countries, which is uh, led by FAO. Um, and they will be discussed, uh, bringing in the climate finance, uh, sorry, they will be uh, bringing to light the work of the CIBIT uh, uh, program and the work on, on the uh, enhanced trans transparency frameworks uh, for that. Uh, and then we have a few sessions that are um, coming, coming more from the angle of Article 6 at, at 10 past 11. The German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action and the, F and the Federal Ministry of the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection, the BMUV, um, will bring partners uh, implementing their, uh, their, their global program to discuss uh, in the session title supporting preparedness for Article 6 cooperation or the, the so-called Spark, Spark 6 program. Um, they, um, uh, they will come in and, uh, and discuss the, the, the lessons learned to date under that initiative. Um, and at a quarter past four, the Ministry of Environment of Peru will also, together with ICAST, will bring the final session of today, highlighting both Article 6 implementation and its integration to the, the enhanced transparency framework of Article 13. Um, so it's, uh, as said, a great way to look at both sort of what does Article 13 mean, what does Article 6 mean, and how are those articles interlinked and interconnected. Uh, so before we hand it over to the first session, uh, last but certainly not least, we would very much like to thank, uh, GGI would very much like to thank the PCCB for the opportunity and the collaboration, along with all the institutions and organizations involved with delivering the sessions today. Um, and I also wish to give a sincere thank and acknowledgement to my own colleagues, particularly Siddhartha Nauduri, who sits uh, in Seoul at our, uh, our headquarters. He is our global lead for MRV uh, and transparency. And he has been working with a team of people to pull together this session. They are actually following us online. So just a hello to everybody who are following the session online. Uh, taking notes so that we can bring the key highlights of the day into uh, the, the PCCB product from, from the week. Um, so uh, that's also very important and something we look forward to future weeks also. So with that and no further ado, I am delighted to hand over the stage to uh, UNFCCC. Um, and uh, any last word? From you? No, I, I think it's a great day and uh, it's the beginning of the great day and I would like to wish everyone, everybody very productive and insightful discussions and outcomes. Thank you very much. Let the show begin. Thank you very much.
Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to the Together for Transparency event on media and communication. Understanding and communicating transparency, the role of the media. That is the title of the event that brings us together today for one hour of discussions about how critical the work of journalists and communication experts and substantive effort experts is to make the Paris Agreement work. Very often, my name is Mariana Castaño, I am climate communication expert, a former journalist, and very often when I talk to people who are not familiar with the UNFCCC process, they ask me, but how is it the Paris Agreement gonna work if there are no sanctions, if there is no um, Security Council you know, telling countries they must be accountable. Well, there are no sanctions, there is no a climate police, but there is a full flesh out accountability and transparency system. There is an acronym, another one more, the ETF, the Enhanced Transparency uh, Framework, which contains how countries must be presenting, all countries signatories of the Paris Agreement must be presenting their reports starting very soon. Because the Paris Agreement is universal, so we are moving from a system or a process where some countries uh, were obliged to present their reports, and now everybody must present reports. So there is a lot of capacity building needed at the government level, but also journalists and communicators must be familiar and uh, versed, well versed on what is the enhanced transparency framework. And that is why this event was put together and I'm very happy to introduce you the, the amazing panel that we have uh, with us. Uh, starting on my right, Shiv Bashir is the UNFCCC Secretariat Team Lead for Content. He works at the Communication and Engagement Division. Veronica Colerio, uh, also from the UNFCCC Secretariat, is a team lead and in charge of coordination of the Enhanced Transparency uh, Framework. And we have two incredible women to my left. They are journalists uh, from a long time ago. They are covering the climate cops from much longer than myself, and I started a few years ago already. Urmi, Urmi Goswami is from the Economic Times of India and Daniela Chiaretti from Valor Economico from Brazil. Thank you very much because I know how busy you are these days covering the negotiations. Thank you for being here. And we are going to start this event uh, with, uh, with uh, remarks from Shiv. Shiv is um, in the Secretariat from only maybe a one month or a few weeks more. So, so this has been really something, I guess, for you, uh, diving into a COP, uh, starting on the job from the, from the scratch. So I'm very, very curious to know uh, how at the C&E Division, Communications and Engagement Division, you are working uh, on the transparency framework on making this digestible and understandable to the people outside. Shiv. Thank you very much, Mariana. Um, um, so good morning everyone, it's great to be in your company uh, today. Um, so as, as Mariana uh, said, I'm the team lead for content um, at the Secretariat of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, um, or as we like to say in our public communications, just UN Climate Change. And there you go, we have two names, um, one official, which let's be honest, is quite uh, quite a mouthful and quite puzzling. Um, and then we have UN climate change, which is obviously a lot more brief and a lot more concise. And at least you know what we are the UN agency for. Um, that's already an insight into the challenges that we face um, here at, at the organization. And things are never quite so simple at the UN, as you all know. Um, yes, climate change is definitely becoming a lot more better understood um, and there's greater awareness. But as for our role, um, yeah, the picture is definitely a lot more complex as an, as a, as an organization. But I'll come to that more in, in a moment. Um, firstly, a disclaimer from my side. Um, as Mariana said, I'm uh, very new to the UN Climate Change Secretariat. I just joined two months ago. Um, secondly, I used to be a journalist myself for many years, um, working in television um, around the world. Um, so at least for now, I consider myself an insider 
but um, in many ways I'm also an outsider still, um, looking into the process. So I do sympathize with many of you sitting here in the room who are trying to, com uh, who are trying to cover uh, this very complex process. One thing I would say is that ours is a very important story to tell. Um, our primary uh, communications objective is to mobilize action on, on climate change, and that's through awareness of the political process taking place. Um, yes, this includes the high-level political dialogue, um, which seeks to address this challenge, and it's very many different facets. Um, but there's also the challenge, uh, th there's also um, the ever-growing technical aspects to our work. Uh, the work that we do with the parties in supporting their mitigation efforts on adaptation, uh, the work on climate finance, and of course transparency, which we are here to discuss uh, today. Um, remember that we're also facilitators of a process that, um, that involves nearly 200 parties, um, and we're also intergovernmental. Um, we're inclusive, um, we bring together civil society, businesses, youth, that's just a few of, uh, of the very many. And they're all deserving of a voice. Um, this diversity of opinion has to be reflected in our communications. Some will say that compromise and consensus is bland, it's boring. It means that you can't really say message messages with teeth. Um, but in reality, I really think that this is, an our, this is our strength. Um, and so I make it my personal objective every day to deliver communications which is creative um, and which reflects all the rich opinions out there and the different perspectives. Um, it's definitely not easy as you can imagine. Let's be honest, uh, the climate emergency is one of the most pressing uh, issues of our time. And in the last, years, uh, last 10 years, myself as a journalist, I've seen it move up the news agenda. I think we can all relate to that. Um, it's gone from being a problem over there to a problem that affects all of us, an ex existential threat to our, to our humanity, to our planet. And this has gone hand in hand with surging interest in the COP. The numbers here testify that, right? There's, there's 50,000 participants. We have well over 3,000 journalists in attendance. Our communications encompasses press releases, web content, photos, videos, social media, that includes Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok. We've got podcasts, we've got apps. We cover, um, we, we do our communications in English. There's French, there's Spanish, there's Russian. We've just hired a new colleague who's gonna be working in Chinese and we've got Arabic in the pipeline. So, you know, we also do the communications in all the six official UN languages. So a, uh, a global organization like ours requires global reach. Our editorial policy, and this is something that I'm still very much um, developing, um, is, is to sound the alarm on the threats that face us, but it's also to tell the inspiring stories of innovation and resilience at the national level, the community level, in science and in business, and misinformation and fact-checking fact is, is a new um, area of our work as well that we're particularly looking to kind of develop. And then of course we have our audiences, governments, policy makers, scientists, climate experts, engineers, civil society, youth groups, indigenous groups. That's just to name a few of, of very, very many. And so we have so many ways in which we need to get our messages out and, and, and tailor our messages as well to these relevant audiences. And that's, of course, where the media come in. It's your, cru it's your role is, is definitely very crucial in translating what you read, what you see, what you hear um, to your audiences in a medium that they can relate to, in a language they understand, in a way that is relevant to them. Media create the pressure and expectation for action they can support transparency on progress and therefore accountability. So both transparency, which, which we're here to talk about, and accountability create that trust. And trust, of course, leads to progress and possibly greater ambition on climate. And that's what we want to see here today. So what I'm saying essentially is that there's a vital role for, for media in supporting the climate negotiations. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and how we can continue to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Keith, for that presentation. So it is incredible how the galaxy of uh, communication tools and channels is growing. 
right? And, uh, and but also it is growing this information and misinformation, so it is a, it's a day everyday challenge. And now we're going to hear from Veronica Colerio a bit of what is it, the enhanced transparency framework, and how does it work? How is it going to help countries to better report their climate action? And of course, help us, all of us, to keep countries and, and non-party stakeholders accountable, Veronica. Thank you, Mariana, and I'm really happy to participate in this, in this panel with you, and I will try to be brief because I'm really interested to hear uh, what you have to tell us because I think you are a very essential part, and if we don't get the message out, yes, it will be our loss and, yes, the loss of humanity, if you think. So, good. So, I will be very fast and tell you a little bit about transparency. Uh, so... Where is transparency in this whole <laughs> scenario of the Paris Agreement? So we have an objective. Uh, we need uh, to strengthen the global response for the climate change crisis. Uh, we need climate resilient and low emissions development, but we also need the support to make that happen. Uh, there has to be action to make that happen. Of course, in adaptation and in mitigation, but for that, developing countries need to get support, not only finance, but also capacity building, and we are in the right place for that, and also technology. Um, but we need to have accountability of what is happening, and that is what one of the components of this accountability is transparency, and it's transparency not only of climate action, but also transparency of the support that is provided, but also the support that is needed. And this accountability and all this information we will be feeding the global stock tape and will be facilitating implementation and compliance. So if you want to see it in a, this is a cycle, uh, parties prepare and communicate their NDCs, the n their national determined contributions, they implement their actions, they provide support, they receive support, they, and then they need to, then you have the enhanced transparency framework. And that's where parties need to show how things are going, what are the actions that they are implementing, how they are tracking their progress towards this uh, NDC. And they do that through their DTRs. I, and you see that I'm already using lots of acronyms which are the, <laughs> the annual transparency reports. And then they also present during COPs in a multilateral uh, session uh, what they have been doing, how they have been doing. So this is important and all this information and data about emissions, about their actions, about their support, uh, goes into and feeds the global stock tape. And then there you will understand what is going on and how all parties are doing. And then you will be able to make further decisions if things are not where they should be. This was not built in Paris. This has <laughs> built, this the story of transparency starts long time ago, 30 years ago, and it's been a process. We have now the enhanced transparency framework, but Today, we also have the MRV and the Dutch Conventions. So parties have been reporting and have been gone through technical analysis or reviews since a long time. And you can see that first reviews for developed countries' inventories were in 2001. So there's parties that have lots of experience and other parties that come uh, also be having experience since 2014 as well. Um, where is transparency in, in the Paris Agreements? There's two articles, and one is linked to the transparency of climate action, and the other, the transparency of support. Uh, this is what you will see uh, in the enhanced transparency framework that parties need to report, and you will see that, I, I think I already s told that, but it's basically to understand their emissions and to understand how they are doing and tracking the progress of their NDC. But it's also important that these reports have 
the support, how the support is provided, how is it targeted, and how it's received. And of course, developing countries need to um, report on what are the capacity building needs that they have. Um, well, this is a little bit the, the, the architecture to understand that not only uh, we have reporting by parties, but also we have the review. There's groups of international experts that come together from all over the world to read these reports and check how the reporting uh, has been done. And this is a very nice uh, experience because experts learn from each other and it's also uh, capacity building. And this is very important because then the party will know uh, how they are doing when reporting and they will get some feedback and they can get even some advice from experts from other countries that face similar challenges and they, they can learn from each other. It's really, it's really a nice part of the process as well. And then we have uh, just these slides to understand that um, 2024 is, December 2024 is the deadline uh, for presenting the first biennial transparency reports and all parties uh, need to do that, but we need to understand that not everybody is at the same starting point. And as I said, develop, developed countries have more experience because they have been undergoing reviews and providing the report for a longer time. And developing countries are really building quickly as well. So the idea is that there is some flexibility for developing countries as well, at that at some point we will get uh, to, to the same point with, with similar uh, quality information from, from all parties. And with that, just a little bit to bring all this reporting and review into perspective and why it is important. Um, at the national level, when you have information, uh, it's easy to get political acceptance of your uh, policies. Also, when you are planning policies, you may know the impacts of these policies. When you have information, it's easier to get support. You need to present your information to get support for your, uh, for your projects that you're planning. You build capacity building, as, as I said, while reporting, you need to form a team in your country. This country needs to work on the reports. And also, if your country is also providing experts to the process, there's a big component of capacity building. And also, awareness is a race because uh, we were, I think we were uh, listening yesterday, so from some parties' representatives that they were saying, yes, our, like, we present this to, to the people in our country and they can see what is happening and they can hold us accountable on what we are building. Internationally, it builds trust. It uh, shows that international obligations are met. If you see that your neighbor is doing something very good, you also want to do it, and that's, that's the nice thing of, of transparency. And that's why the ambition gets further. And the support is prioritized to where the needs are there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. And this PowerPoint and, uh, and even uh, a full uh, manual on how the EGF <laughs> works uh, is available or will be available. The manual is already there, but this PowerPoint will be available uh, in the UNFCCC website, um, Transparency, Together for Transparency section. So we have a very, very complex uh, accumulation of 30 years of decisions and uh, reporting obligations under the convention, Kyoto Protocol, now the Paris Agreement. But then also outside of this process, we have the IPCC, the WMO producing the state of the climate reports. You have UNEP and the UNFCCC producing the state of the pledges, if I may say, report, meaning if countries delivered on what they are promising, are we still on track or not? And these reports are saying that we are off track. And then the reporting on the actual action, that is what it is going to happen with the enhanced transparency framework. That is why it is so critical that journalists are 
knowledgeable and that they have the tools and access to the information to do their job because that is at the heart of journalist job. It is to help the public opinion have a clear idea of how the powers are doing, if they are doing what they are promising or not. So now I turn to our journalists, um, Urmi and Daniela, and uh, sincerely, we are not going to teach you how to do your job. At the heart of your job is to, to work on transparency, to go to the sources, dig out the information on those reports, but how are you finding it easy or difficult to report on transparency on actual action? Urmi. Hi, oh, thank you for having us. And uh, you know, it's a very interesting question. And as uh, you know, the PowerPoint has been done, I was trying to think of all the negotiations that are happening on, on developing the enhanced transparency framework, and my mind went completely blank. Uh, perhaps uh, there is a need even for journalists to sort of dig in and understand what, what is there, you know, the rules that are made under the, under 13.5 and 13.6. But that is, that, that is sort of a more involved process and that needs to happen. But what happens currently is that we do depend on a whole plethora of, you know, reports that exist which try to explain to us, uh, sorry, uh, which try to explain to us uh, where countries are, right? So when we are talking, I'll give the example of finance because that's easiest to give. But even then it's not easy because it depends on which report you pick up, right? So what is their definition of climate finance? Or, uh, but broadly, you know, there are certain files. So there's loans, there are grants, there are concessional loans, uh, whether it's coming from ODA or it's private sector. So uh, critical, it's critical that we understand this as journalists so that we can write about it a little more knowledgeably than we do right now. Right now what we do is we rely, we are actually standing on other people's shoulders, which is great as long as those shoulders are nice and broad. What happens if you know, think about it. In the past few years, you have had companies, each one saying that they're going to do net zero or we are going to, how do you actually begin to understand whether they're on the right track? You have to go somewhere else. So uh, in a sense, we also rely on the capacities that you're building because we too will go and ask, please tell us, is this doing okay or not? Or we have to learn what are the, you know, the identifier moments. As I, th the reason why I picked up the example on finance is now we know we should look very quickly how much is loan, how much is concessional loan, how much is commercial loan. And we know which questions to ask. So I think that's the critical part because in a sense this, this new world of the enhanced transparency framework, which got built up and finished uh, in not this COP but the previous one, and the one previous to it actually, is something that's still new. And perhaps maybe when the first reports come in under the new, under the ETF, we'll begin to learn what to look for. So it's going to be a bit of trial and error for us. But the questions remain the same, right? I mean, you promised X, whether it's reduction or uh, of emissions or support, have you been able to show it? Definitely. And on top of that difficulty of uh, being well equipped and, and knowledgeable of what is it out there and how to read the data and who's behind the data, which is very important then, on top of that, at the national level, you also have 197 realities, right? And, uh, and we know that those realities uh, depend on the willingness um, of the political powers to be more or less transparency or maybe just the capacity of the countries to make this data available because um, you know, for, for low and medium income, sometimes countries, it's, it's a challenge, right? Because they don't have the people or the technology. And uh, I would like now to turn to Daniela. Daniela, you've been doing an incredible work keeping powers accountable and going to the sources. And, and we, it, it, I know it's not, of course, always easy and there are difficulties, but You've seen this process grow and these layers of complexity accumulating. 
how do you see the current status of the transparency framework and how do you see this can help journalists as you and, or and Urmi do your job? Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, everybody, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning. Um, I, I was thinking when Mariana invited me, I was thinking what could I say about transparency uh, in my work. And I was, I thought I never, w I never used this word in my, in my reports and I was always trying to work in this issue. So if you say to the readers uh, that this is about transparency, I don't think it's a very sexy issue on climate. Uh, but you can write about it without saying it, it, uh, this word. So I can write about NDCs without using the word NDCs. I'm just using the word climate goals and things like that. Uh, because I think our, our job is to try to bring people to this issue, uh, otherwise we are failing. Um, and then I was thinking, so Brazil, Brazil is communicating every, uh, the single reports, they are doing their things. Uh, the reports are very complicated. They are not transparent because these numbers and this this uh, this issue is is too complicated. Um, so, how do we reward? Uh, I think there are more reports, and we have to show to the our readers, our public, that these reports they are not always saying the same thing. So for instance, on finance, that Urmi was, was uh, uh, saying, uh, if, you, if you get the famous 100 billion uh, figure uh, that, that should come for uh, the developing world, uh, you, you will have different numbers. One is the UNFCC figure, the other is the OACD figure. So I, I think journalists, w uh, we, don't, we, we have to show there is no transparency because there are two numbers that doesn't speak the same thing. Uh, maybe this is too complicated to measure, but it's, uh, I think it is to, to show that this, this is complicated is our, our role. Um, and I was also, if I, if I can make a comparison on the pandemic, and, and I'm Brazilian, and as you know, we, we, we just, uh, there was a big election uh, some days ago, and it was, it was very hard. And uh, these last years uh, it, uh, for the press, it was very complicated to talk about transparency in the Bolsonaro uh, government. So to give you an example, not on climate, which is far more complicated, but on the pandemic. Uh, when the pand so the pandemic hits, th uh, thousands of Brazilians died, as you know. We were the third country that with more fatalities. And at a certain point, the government was not telling the press the numbers, how many cases of COVID we had and how many people died that day. And so something extraordinary happened because the media, the outlets that, uh, that were competitors, they, were, they, they, they made a coalition. As the government was not transparent on that, on that numbers, uh, all of all of uh, um, many many media in Brazil, we started to ask the state, every state, every department in Brazil, how many fatalities we have at, at that day, and so we were producing our data, and I think this is uh, every day we are telling. Uh, 
the public in the television so how many Brazilians died from COVID and how many were uh, sick. And th that, that was a number that the uh, consortium, this coalition of media has, has produced, uh, has uh, done. And um, my last point is about emissions. So uh, the emissions in Brazil, uh, you know, deforestation, we have a very solid, a very strong monitoring uh, uh, system uh, that comes from the 80s with Catalan Catalan Catalan. And uh, uh, what happens? into the Amazon what is going on. And so uh, there is another uh, system that was built by the civil society and universities and, um, and uh, a lot of institutes that are showing in a very accurate way what is going on with emissions in Brazil, sector by sector. And so, uh, what my point is, this is all about transparency. So you can, you can find as a reporter uh, another sources of uh, information if that one doesn't work. Definitely, and, and journalists and uh, communicators look up at the United Nations sometimes to make sense of this accumulation of data that you don't know if the, those shoulders we are on are solid and, and broad. And fortunately that the UN is um, a, a solid source of information. She one briefly, I w want to, to turn to you. Uh, and, and the UN, and when I was at the UNFCCC Secretariat, you kind of feel the heavy weight of being at the center of this ecosystem. We have now 44,000, maybe more people coming in. I don't know how many journalists, Three, four thousand. I mean, this has quadrupled, right? Four, four growth since I started many years ago. It can be overwhelming. How, from the UNFCCC communications department, you try to kind of separate the wheat, the wheat from the wrath and make sense of all this tsunami of information so that journalists can do their job. Thank you, Mariana. That's a really, really good question. I mean, we have like a range of communication products, as I, as I mentioned uh, in, in my intervention earlier. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have a, you know, we, we cater for the different audiences because there are different, you know, the different audiences are looking for different types of information, right? There are some who are looking for the real minutiae detail. We have some journalists here who are working in, in the industry, in the trade, for example, and they're looking to hear about various kind of like technology, um, and, and the kind of regulations around that. And then we, of course, have the wider public as well, who climate change is, there might be some awareness about it, but there isn't necessarily that in-depth level of knowledge. So we have a different range of, of products. Um, if you go to our website, for example, you will find pages where you can find the real kind of documents which go through the minutes um, of, of, of various different meetings, but then you'll also find the press releases in which we try to synthesize um, I, I, d I don't want to say generalized because, you know, we don't engage in dumbing down as such, um, but we need to kind of speak to a in, in a language that people are going to understand and it's not going to turn them off, you know, because that's the last thing you want. You, you, you don't necessarily want to use such complicated language and terminology so that people are just switched off by, by this. Um, so, yeah, a range of different products, um, a, a range of, um, of, of different mediums that we use and, of course, the different languages that we're also using as well but also having that kind of very strong relationship with the media. You know, of course, we have the media center where you're receiving all the different press releases, all the different event um, notifications. So you can come in and, and filter, filter through what you actually need to kind of get out to your audiences. Thank you very much for that, Shiv. And, and now I would like to, will to hear the, the ask from, uh, from you as journalists, what could uh, the Secretariat and, and the Transparency Division do. Um, of course, they have, they are mandated to put out these reports, uh, but how could they even 
go further in facilitating your work? What is it that you find difficult and what could be helpful? So, uh, you know, the thing about uh, what basically is transparency at the end of the day, to make clear, right? Now, uh, there are a lot of technical details that come in, which will come in because of actions on, uh, and support on both sides. So how do you make those things understandable to us? Or at the same time, also what are the guidelines? Again, I go back to the uh, example of companies. Now when a company says I'm going to go net, net zero or I'm going to, I'm looking at reducing my emissions or I'm looking at uh, uh, emission reduction of 50% by say 2030, the question you end up be asked is scope one, scope two, scope three. This has been possible because between the IPCC and the UNFCCC, there has been an, an sort of an explanation of what each one is. We now know what, what they are. Frankly speaking, if I'm very honest, uh, very often I can't figure out which one goes in the scope two and which one goes in the scope three. But nonetheless, it becomes a tool to ask the question. Then with the answer, I can go to somebody else and say, can you tell me if they've got it right, if I can't figure it out. But I think, you know, those are the nitty gritties and on which journalists, at least a large number of journalists will always depend on experts. But you know, if you, if you want to really think about it, and I know that the, this conversation uh, is around the ETS in that sense, but as journalists, we, I would broaden the lens of transparency. And by that, uh, what do I mean? I mean that when you look at countries, companies talking, you are not only looking at you know, the details they're giving, which fits into the ETF, or I mean, not for companies, but definitely for countries, but beyond that. Are they actually saying what they're doing or have they done something in another sphere? And I think that is where the value add comes from journalists. Okay, so there's, let's presume country X says that I'm going to do net zero by 2050. Country Y says I'm going to do net zero by 2055. But you, and that's, that's happening in this, in this forum, but you know in another forum, they are talking about investing in say, you know, gas somewhere, or somebody's building up a, and the other country is building up new coal, coal power plants. That ability to get the information from that outside to, to shine the light and ask the question. So I may or may not understand the nitty gritty of the ETF, but I do understand what a gas, what investing in gas and setting up a coal plow, power plant does. So therefore, the, the, I think in a sense that what we have is a kind of a, a symbiotic relationship. So the first step that I would, I would think I would ask of the Secretariat is to make simpler for us uh, what the, the nitty gritty of the ETF, of the, uh, of the framework. So that I then am, I in a sense learn to create the tools that I need to be able to ask the question. Definitely, and I see Veronica taking notes <laughs> as a homework after this event. Daniela, Daniela, what, what, what could facilitate your everyday life at the COP and, and during the year when you do your job? <laughs> Water and coffee. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> For sure, that's, that's a good start. Well, Thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the, yeah, okay, sorry. I think the report, the UN report help, help us a lot because w uh, the first thing is that we know the source. Um, I, I guess that maybe Urmi and other colleagues and journalists now, uh, we, have, we have a problem that we have a lot of sources that, new sources, and we don't know who these people are and uh, which credibility they have and, and, and the data. So when, when the, for me, when the report is under a UN agency, I know, I know, and we are going to, to give a lot of space for that. This is the first thing. 
So, for instance, UNEP, Adaptation Gap, it's a, it's a preference for us. Or the, the, uh, the emissions gap, it's another thing. So, and uh, th th these, are these are very useful because we know the source, we know that it's from the UN, this is important for all the journalists, I think. And so, uh, yeah. The other thing is that, as Umi was saying, sometimes we are we are comparing oranges with apples, in the, and this is complicated. And so I gave up of trying to. So I, I just try to show to the readers we are comparing. These are the oranges, and these are the apples, to be because we, we cannot uh, translate what is not the reality. So uh, when you cannot compare, just show that there is a problem there. Um, I was thinking about the next year, the global stock taking, which is a very important moment. And so I guess for our work, it will be good to have your report and send to us what is going on. And then, um, and then also to look what the civil so the, the, the society, the NGOs, the institutions are saying. This is also important because it, it gave, they gave us another, another perspective of it's not the, it's, it's what other researchers are doing, other, other views. I think this is also important because we are dealing with a new meta, new, a new world. And so it's, it's nice to hear uh, new visions. And in that sense, also the indigenous people and, 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 and the young people and everybody. So, well, yeah, m more easy reports for us to, to work. Mariana, if I may add, add something, it just struck me. You know what would really make our lives good? I mean, since you asked us that question, not just water and coffee. I mean, that would help. But, uh, you know, Danny is right. I mean, we now have a plethora of reports from different sources. The fact that somebody is putting something out there means that at least they're willing to put their name to it. So therefore, they're claiming that this what I say is, is true. And it may be true, you know, because it's a matter, sometimes it's a matter of perspective. We all know statistics is how you skin them, right? Uh, it depends on how you, uh, how, how you uh, sort of use them. You can tell different stories. But what would do uh, us a lot of, uh, give us a lot of help is if, if an agency like the uh, UNFCCC, a UN agency, puts itself to, it's not just that I produce a report and I'll do a press conference, but allow for, for questions. You know, how do I, how do we lift the veil? Can you explain this to us, you know? What, how does it happen? If that would be really good, because that, maybe it doesn't have to be done forever, but it's just something that will teach us a little bit more. Just pulling the veil back so that we too understand what's happening. So but, and Mariana, yes, if, I, if yes. I may, another thing I forgot. Somebody mentioned fake news. And I think, uh, I think we are not going to get rid of fake news anymore in the world. So uh, we have to deal with them. And to deal with them, we have to, to have very good facts and, and data that are uh, easy to access. To go and, because otherwise the fake news will spread and then it will be complicated to say it's not true. Uh, so we have to have very fast data to say, no, this is not true, and access to this data. Definitely, and the word that I didn't hear, but it is like the elephant in the room, the greenwashing, right? Which is the other risk that we need all uh, to fight. I, I was just reading the BBC, and they they speak about a, a, a rise in the number of lobbyists from the from the fossil for the fossil fuel industries uh, coming to the cops because everyone has an interest, everyone has a story. So we need to help journalists also separate. Uh, what it is, um, the, the wheat from the chaff, super important. I, now I would like to give the, the opportunity to the audience to ask questions 
to our panelists. So please, yes, raise your hand and introduce yourself and please ask a, a question for comments. You can go on one-on-one -on -one after. Thank you. Antigua. Many of these reports do not include the contributions of the local community groups who are making significant contributions to mitigate the climate um, impacts. And there's need for even our local groups to enforce advocacy, ensuring that what is sent out to UNFCC include, it's an all-inclusive process. Because I'm working with about 25 groups in Antigua. We contribute to the UNCBD national reports, but for the UNFCC, uh, apart from the BUR some years ago, we have not contributed. And our work is significant. And so there needs to be, you know, that mechanism where inclusion and participation is important. We have signed on to the Eskazo Agreement, so our voice matters. And we're going to insist that our work is recognized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Veronica, maybe if you would like to react. No, just to, to agree with you that this is, this is very important. And, and I think... We're yet to see uh, how the reports uh, come, but I, I, and I know little by little, as I said, we are, countries are improving and are getting better. And my suggestion to you is talk to your government, try to know who is the climate people there. And I see Alma on the back. This is our secretariat lead for, for the BUR uh, team and, and I'm thinking, yes, that's, uh, that's very important and, and I agree uh, the contribution of everybody in the country needs to be shown in, in their reports. And we've been seeing it little by little coming, and, but I'm sure there's more that can be done. Thank you. Yes, I see a hand. Uh Okay, we start with the lady in, in black, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful insight. Uh, my name is Victoria Paul from Nigeria. I want to agree with uh, Daniela that there are fake news going around. And in order to reduce this fake news, I want to advise um, the UNFCC Secretariat if there is a way they could create a little capacity building for the journalists so that they will be able to report climate actions, climate initiations, climate measures in a transparent and accurate way. So please create a training for the journalists so that they can report accurately. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. So uh, Transparency Academy. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much, Victoria, for your question um, and, and comment. I, th I think that's um, very, very important. There is already a tool that was launched, I think it was very early when I, when I just joined a, a couple of months ago, so early September, um, which I know the UNFCCC uh, contributed to. Um, it's 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 a um, a web resource which explains you know what to look out for with when it comes to climate misinformation and how you can take action as well and I think I'm quite sure it covers advice for journalists as well. Um, I will try to find you the link. I don't have it right here, but I, I do know where it exists. I'm happy to forward that to you. Um, but yes, it, I absolutely agree. I think that's the first step, but it's a long journey and. I think misinformation is one of those things that will continue to evolve as social media, I think, also continues to evolve and I think it will become a lot more pervasive. Um, so yeah, watch this space and I think this is something that's gonna continue for, for, for a long time to come. Thank you, Sheep. Please. Yeah. And also we had another lady who wanted to ask at the back. Yeah. Um, good morning, thank you for this um, important panel. Uh, I'm Boris van Westering from Internews. I live in the Netherlands now happily in Egypt. Um, with transparency comes accountability. And accountability for journalists is a very dangerous thing. 
Um, so my question also to you is, in um, most environments where accountability structures are lacking, um, where safety infrastructure is absent, um, how do you want to foster accountability and transparency uh, while knowing at the same time that danger is around the corner? And we are in Egypt, we all know that here it's also a problem. Uh, so how do you ensure also the safety of journalists enshrined in SDG 16.10.2 or 1? Another question is related to communication and the language that you use. When I come home, my son is 10 years old and he wants to know what I have uh, been doing here. Um, and I'm also very appreciated about the comments about training and training journalists, but I would like to reverse the narrative. Should we not train you to use the language that we need? Good point, good point, and we, it's great, she is a former journalist, I am a former journalist, and I think very modestly, but that makes a difference when, when you come to this kind of, of positions, and safe space for journalists to do uh, their job, well, I think uh, you nail it, yeah. How can the, the UN, and I, I personally think the UN uh, is doing all in their hands to create a safe space within the COP, but she, maybe if you want to touch upon that. Yeah, just, just to add, um, Marona, and, and thank you for your question. Um, concerning the safety of, of journalists, I mean, we have, you know, we have an agreement with, with the host country here about, you know, the roles and responsibilities of, of, you know, not just journalists, but human rights activists who are also present here. Um, it's, it's, it's a very complicated issue, but it's something that's well, uh, well rehearsed, well, well practiced in, in, in very many cops uh, from, from previous years, and it's, and it's working this year as well. Um, it's something that we're very, very um, aware of. Um, you'll follow social media as much as I do. You know that there have been, on the, on the margins, there have been some issues, there have been some discussions, um, and you know we're across, across those, but so far I think it's, it's working, and it remains a, 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 a priority for us moving forward as well, um, so yeah. Thank you very much see you for that. And we have a last question. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, hi, my name is uh, Lise Mauvais from The New Arab and I cover um, climate change in the Levant Middle East region. Thank you so much for your presentation. And the question um, I had is, it wasn't clear to me from the presentation which stages of this transparency process will lead to um, the publication of reports that are fully available to the public and I'm asking specifically about the biennial transparency report. So I want to understand if journalists and the public will be able to see what countries are reporting to the UN FCC before uh, review by the ETF. And the reason I'm asking is because access to information and data is so difficult in the Middle East in particular, but throughout the world. And so many governments are not providing figures to journalists. So if, this, if these figures are being uh, collected and, and provided to the UN, um, we need to think about whether the public should also have access to it. Thank you very much. So all reports submitted by uh, countries to the UNFCCC are publicly available in our website. I know that we need to improve our website. Sometimes it's not so easy to find them, but I'm happy to show you where they are. And this will be the case for the BTRs. The moment, actually, the report is submitted, we have a team that publishes. And it's published before it's, it's reviewed by, by, by experts. And then also the, the review, the reports of the reviews are also available. And when countries need to answer questions from other countries, those questions and answers are also available in our website. So I, th the only thing that I can say that sometimes it's not so easy to find this information, but everything is available. Thank you, and just one last question, please. Yes, unfortunately we need to wrap up for the next event to start. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, um, the, one of the key areas for transparency is the question of access to information. In Africa, for example, we have 
less than 30 countries that have access to information laws. We have in our constitutions. So we wanted to see how the UNFCCC is promoting the right of access to information in you know, the, the countries that are your members so that they effectively implement on the ground and their citizens, not only journalists, but also citizens can engage. And of course, journalists can benefit as well as to get the right information and get out of the secrecy and promote transparency. Yeah, absolutely. Meet the people where the people are, right? The UNFCCC is in Bonn and is everywhere <laughs> because the, everybody's coming to the cops from everywhere. You have the regional collaboration centers also, but Sheep, no doubt the, there is a, a more direct uh, need for a connection, right? Yeah, I have to say I'm not, I'm not familiar enough at this stage as to what work we're doing to kind of facilitate that. Um, I, I think it's a really good question and I would absolutely think that there is a need to do that. But, you know, we're part, we're, we're an agency in a very, very big UN broad family and I know that there are agencies who are working on this issue, so hopefully there are synergies there. Um, if they don't already exist, and they're, I think, worth developing. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Ship. Thank you, Veronica, Urmi, Daniela. Special thanks to you for making space in your agendas for us today. And thank you very much to all the journalists who are here with us, to all the public and those watching online the conversation on Together for Transparency continues in this capacity building hub. And of course, if you have other questions, please uh, stay in the room and the speakers will be uh, happy to answer. Thank you very much. Have a beautiful day.
participation of Article 6 in this fourth capacity building hub at the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. I want to thank, thank the UNFCCC capacity building team for giving us the opportunity of having this event here today. I also want to thank our leading partner, GGGI and GIZ, helping us to organize this event. An international carbon market is an essential piece of the climate change mitigation puzzle. It can support the achievement of core cost efficient greenhouse gas emission reductions and of transformational sustainable development in implementing countries. Many, many countries are just beginning to understand the depth and the scope of efforts requiring to participate in the global carbon market. Countries who are considering hosting mitigation activities under Article 6 must, among other things, address the basic participation and reporting requirements of the Paris Rulebook, decide on strategies to manage overselling risks, for example, and determine criteria for authorizing transfers. Furthermore, countries need to think about how to use Article 6 activities to implement parts of the NDC and how to raise ambition for these activities. Thus, broad and lasting skills in carbon prices and carbon markets needs to be built based in public, private and academic sectors in all countries. This will contribute to the development of a vibrant international market. For Germany, the use of Article 6 starts with a good contribution to capacity building and there seems to be a broad consensus that strengthening support for capacity building in the implementing countries with respect to the robust implementation of Article 6 is very high on the agenda. For this reason, we are supporting a number of both multilateral and bilateral capacity building activities in different regions and countries. Today, I want to highlight our most recent program, Supporting Preparedness for Article 6 Cooperation, or short, SPARE 6C. It provides country-specific support to Colombia, Pakistan, Thailand, and Zambia. It includes an important work package on outreach and dissemination of lessons learned, a toolbox for best practice, guidance, will be developed to be shared with other interested countries. And an exchange forum established the community of practice for Article 6, six implementing, implementing, implementing countries, which I'm happy to announce that it was successfully launched yesterday. This forum will be open for government practitioner, practitioners private sector and academia and will develop and share research-based best practices and lessons learned in Article 6 engagement. Last but not least, it is of course also important to foster capacities to be able to identify mitigation options and therefore I would like to highlight a second program, the Climate Action Program for the Chemical Industry, CAPSI. The aim of the project is to strengthen the capacities of a key actor from public and private sector for effective climate protection in the chemical industry in selected developing and emerging countries, thereby enabling them to tap climate protection potentials in chemical production and the value chains associated with it. Chairing and learning from experiences is not only useful for governmental representatives. Private sector actors and academia can give important insight and offer their perspectives to hopefully speed, speed up greenhouse uh, gas uh, mitigation globally. 
including the implementation of Article 6 transactions. It's important to anchor know-how among all stakeholders and to build sustainable capacity structures in countries. Therefore, we have invited some experts here today to hear about their experiences and reflections on how to address sustainability and capacity building for carbon pricing and Article 6 implementation, identifying mitigation options in specific sectors and how to address efforts to promote improved capacity for climate action. We will hear from two storytellers about their experiences in mentorship and from two practical examples followed by a panel discussion about challenges and solutions to achieving lasting impact through capacity building uh, efforts in developing countries. I want to thank all the panelists for agreeing to share their insights with us, with us today, and I'm looking forward to an interesting and very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a great introduction. So, hello. Now it's your uh, um, uh, turn to, to talk about, I, I think I, I'm really looking forward to, to your story, which you would like to tell us. And uh, and meanwhile, I op of course hope that our second storyteller will also appear here in, in the room. But um, I think uh, you have uh, this uh, special, um, situation that you, as I understood, recently also made an internship uh, at uh, GGGI. So I'm really looking forward to hear your experience in this regard. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Malin. Thank you, Sir Stefan, for your support uh, in building capacity because it is the crucial, not only for youth, but for everyone to develop their professional career. My name is Hala Al Hamawi. I'm currently acting as an accreditation and compliance specialist for the Green Climate Fund requirements with the Global Green Growth Institute. It is an honor and uh, a significant uh, opportunity uh, to tell my story about an internship that I had. Not because uh, it is my first time to say it, but it's my first time to say it in front of seniors. And perhaps it is an opportunity for decision makers in institution, including the public and private one, uh, to hear how an internship can support youth in building their career. So in 2019, where I had five years of experience in water, sanitation, and hygiene sector, I was awarded Chevening Scholarship by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the United Kingdom to pursue my master's degree in engineering management. Then, after the master's degree, I returned home re uh, holding my certificate and having five years of experience. But I never thought that I'm gonna be doing volunteering work or an internship. I thought that I'll be going directly for a position where I return back to be a practitioner. One of my dear mentors in life advised me to apply for an internship with, with, with GGGI, where they required an, an experience in wash and green growth sector. To be honest, at that time, I had no clue what is green growth or Article 6. So I did my homework, I prepared myself for the interview. And I was lucky to get the opportunity and to start my journey with GGGI. So there was a great leader who walked the way with me, uh, my journey in GGGI. And we started by setting the key performance indicators and deliverables that I'll be working on during my internship, which set the ground for me and helped me to know where I'm heading. So during the internship, I managed to write a whole technical report reflecting where is the, where is the status of WASH uh, in schools on a national level. And not only that, he gave me the opportunity to develop a concept note to do a pilot project based on that report. 
And to be honest, while I was uh, a wash officer, I didn't get that chance. Not only this, with the greeny growth, I had to contribute, or basically I had the owner to contribute to building a capacity building program, the material delivering session on a greeny growth. And guess for who? For government officials. So one of the skills that I always wanted to gain was public speaking. It was always a challenge thing for me. And the leader was really good and strong public speaker. So I was like, can you help me? How can I be like you one day? And he gave me tips and tricks to go through and started engaging me in workshops and sessions to engage more with the stakeholders. And during that, I also did a good networking with people working on the climate change mitigation and adaptation on a global and local level from private and public sector. So that was a key skill that I always wanted to gain. And now I'm really proud that sometimes I'm, a I'm being asked just to moderate high-level sessions for ministers in Jordan, which is a great opportunity for me. Though I'm youth, I'll be the youngest one, but also helping them to facilitate the session. So to be honest, uh, the idea behind, behind the internship is opening many opportunities and doors that you would never think that you will get the chance for that. I didn't know the value of the internship until I went through it. And uh, the last thing I'd like to highlight is uh, that that experience it prepared me well to engage more in a climate action, to understand in depth what are the priorities and what are the priorities in adaptation and mitigation uh, level, and how the context of the country play a huge role in identifying the priorities. So internships are really important to gain skills, level up your knowledge, do good networking on a global and local level. So uh, the last thing I want to highlight about internship, uh, I'm not sure if you got the chance to watch a movie called The Intern by Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. I watched it a couple of years ago, and I recognized that internship are not only important for youth, we need to allow seniors, ladies that who spent a lot of time at home and then decided to go back to the workforce to do internships as well. We also need to think about youth who graduated and stayed at home for long years and uh, were um, unemployed, but they were looking for an opportunity. Internships are really valuable and important to kick, uh, to kick off your journey in the professional career. So I really advise you to see that movie and perhaps inspire international institution to be flexible a bit with the requirement for internships because there are many there are many people that are interested to enter a new area and learn from it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing this experience. Um, I think later on in the panel discussion, we uh, will f surely ask a little bit more about uh, how this will work out also for you in future. But now uh, I will uh, continue with uh, our two uh, examples, um, because it's also important to, to see how really uh, mitigation options are, where are they, and uh, how to, to um, get the idea to, to scrutinize which kind of uh, option you have in, in specific sectors and what kind of instruments are the right one to, to address uh, these mitigation options. So uh, therefore, I would like uh, to invite uh, Tarim Patanan to uh, make a presentation on sp their specific project in the industry sector in Thailand. The floor is yours, please. Thank you, Marlene, and uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, delegates and colleagues. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the government of Germany and the UNFCCC capacity building team and also the, all the organizer for um, hosting this important sign event and also for the opportunity of uh, Thailand to share our activities under the um, Climate Action Program for uh, chemical industry uh, today. Um, I'm not so sure if you uh, see all the slides. Um, okay. I'd like to just to give you the overview of uh, Thailand greenhouse gas um, profile, which is the latest estimation uh, in 2018 from our fourth uh, national communication. So um, we only, uh, for direct emission, we only contribute to less than 1% of the, the total greenhouse gas emission, uh, which is uh, below the world average. But for um, the IPPU, or the industrial process and product use, uh, which is part of the chemical industry, contribute to around 11% of share. The majority um, would fall under the energy sector, contributing around 69, 70% and also the waste sector around four or five percent. So uh, all of these three sex the sectors would be important for the, uh, the emission from chemical industry. Um, and then with the um, IPPU sector, which is under my uh, department responsibility, um, you can see that the first, uh, the largest um, emitter is from mineral and cement industry. Um, the second is the chemical industry, and the third is the, the F gases or the, the RAC, uh, refrigeration and air conditioning um, industry. So um, we can say that the chemical industry is uh, very important in climate sense. Uh, this is um, the measure from initial uh, NDC target uh, of Thailand. Uh, we aim to uh, reduce 20 to 25 percent by 2030. Um, on the measure for under the energy and transport, the waste sector and also uh, the IPPU sector, like like I mentioned before, that uh, we included or the uh, the cement crinkle substitution and also the replacement of uh, ref high GWP refrigerant under the IPPU sector. And for chemical industry, um, currently um, the mitigation measure is not yet included under the IPPU sector uh, NDC, but maybe for under the waste or uh, the energy sector, which is an, uh, renewable energy or energy efficiency. Um, but for Thailand, um, current rules, the mitigation outcome that resulted from uh, the NDC measures are not allowed uh, to transfer under uh, Article 6, but uh, we only trade within the domestic market. So um, the artic Article 6 type of project should be the measure that outside the NDC. So the possibility, whatever um, come from the chemical industry that fall under the IPPU sector, uh, there is uh, opportunity to develop the Article 6 type of project. And um, at COP26 last year, uh, Thailand raised our um, NDC target from the 20 to 25 to 40%, uh, with, uh, if uh, provided the condition that we receive uh, sufficient international support. So by 2030, we also aim to reach um, carbon neutrality by 2050 and the net zero um, emission by 2065. And uh, it's also quite challenging uh, for, for Thailand as well. So um, the contribution from 
the chemical industry would uh, uh, play a key role in our long-term strategy like the carbon neutrality or the net zero um, emission target and also for future uh, updated NDC if we are to raise additional uh, ambition uh, more than 40%. And, and, and of course, like, like I mentioned, that there is a possibility of develop Article 6 uh, type of project as well. And um, like most of us um, may are aware that the, even the chemical industry contribute to greenhouse gas emission, um, this industry is also very important for our um, economy. Um, it involves in, in every aspect of our life, you know, from basic chemicals to agricultural chemicals to consumer products, and also in pharmaceutical and healthcare industry, textile, automobile industry. So more than 95% of um, other industry also use chemicals and chemical products in their processes. So, um, Yes, the chemical industry is very important. Um, some can say that uh, the chemical industry can be a hidden climate hero, uh, which is um, can contribute or support uh, decarbonization of uh, the industry as well. So uh, this is just showing um, the global chemical value chain. So when we talk about the chemical industry, we're just not, not talking about chemical industry, but uh, we cover all the various supply chain from the up, upstream indus, industry like feedstocks to, um, to downstream uh, processes and industry and to, to end market products. So all of this uh, value chain should should be taken into account when we address uh, the climate issue under, uh, for the chemical industry. So I'll come to the, the CAPC program. So Thailand joined the Climate Action Program for the chemical industry, which is supported by um, BMUV, which is the, the German Ministry of Environment under the, the ICCI, um program. Uh, this is the global project with focus on three to five countries. The focus three countries is, uh, if I remember correctly, Argentina, Ghana, and Thailand. Another is Peru and Vietnam, uh, also joining some activities uh, under the project. So uh, CAPSI aims to pro provide information and uh, capacity building of key sector in the chemical industry like government, a private industry, and also a academic institution um, on the sustainable chemistry and climate change, uh, and also to tap the mitigation potential uh, in the chemicals uh, production and uses. So the, um, the key capacity building um, approach of CAPSI is um, action-oriented uh, knowledge transfer. So um, this is uh, this this approach uh, would contribute to a more lasting capacity building um, in our country. You know, through activities like um, technical webinars, um, training of trainers, and also the um, the practical site visit. Uh, to uh, like uh, G German um, technologies or uh, chemical industries so that we can learn and apply, uh, apply back in our country. And also um, another key element is that the involvement of uh, multi-stakeholders. Uh, with the Thailand CAPSI um, team, we involve um, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Environment, and also um, the Federation of Thai Industry, and also the, the people from university as well uh, that uh, join our um, project team in Thailand. So um, 
the impact of, of this uh, CAPC program will also be like um, development of the mitigation uh, roadmap for the chemical industry in individual country. So um, this final slide, just, just to show you the potential mitigation action that uh, if anyone interested in um, the cooperation on development of Article 6 types of project, uh, this, this is just initial identification from the national stakeholder dialogues. Um, the first group is uh, the most viable and already invested by the chemical industry, like uh, the easy, um, easy measures that, uh, to, to operate, like mechanical recycling or chemical recycling, and uh, renewable energy like solar rooftop for self-consumption within the company, or improvement of uh, process efficiency, re replacement of general equipment like boilers and burners, um, and also another ongoing activity is the reduction of nitrous um, oxide in the nitric acid or caprolactam production plant. This is under the NACAC program, if uh, anyone uh, has heard of. And another um, measure is the carbon recycling in ethylene oxide plant. Um, and then the upcoming measures that some industry already test the feasibility study, but uh, not really um, invested is the use of ethanol as feedstocks and also the large scale renewable energy like solar farm. Um, another potential technology that we are looking at the moment and some feasibility study is underway is the the carbon capture and utilization and storage, and also the hydrogen, the green hydrogen power. But uh, yes, we st still need to develop more uh, supporting infrastructure and also the or the regulation. You know, like, if, like for example, the green hydrogen. There can be uh, the safety issue that come with this technology as well in in our country. Yep. Thank you very much, and that's all for my. Um, yeah, for my information for now, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I like very much your uh, expression that uh, uh, the chemical sector or industry could be uh, the hidden climate uh, hero, and as well as uh, that you gave us uh, a first list of potential uh, mitigation project that could be developed by the youth, <laughs> for instance. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, Karen, so now you have to, to put the brackets between uh, uh, the presentation of Alal and uh, Tarin to, to um, explain how uh, this uh, um, capacity building could enhance and be implemented in a lasting way. The floor is yours, thank you. I think I will need some help in uh, finding the right presentation. Thanks a lot. My name is Karen Olsen, and uh, I represent the SPARK project that you heard about uh, in the very first opening remarks. And as Marlin has said, I will talk about how to achieve lasting capacity and skills for Article 6 implementation, which is the approach we've taken in what we call the COP-ASIC, another acronym, but this is the community of practice 
for Article 6 implementing countries. And I come from the UNEP Copenhagen Climate Center, which is based in Denmark. Um, the outline is first an introduction to the project. What are the goals of the community of practice? The timeline we are working within, how we work, for instance, in an annual workshop, and how we want to link with other initiatives. There are a lot in this space. So the spark the theory of change is um, setting up activities to achieve this impact. We call it the ultimate impact, which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in a cost-effective and flexible way using the markets while ensuring environmental integrity. A ton is a ton. Uh, how can we know? And not only that, we also want to do it in a way that we achieve positive sustainability impacts. So the theory of change is to um, facilitate carbon transactions through innovative ways of mitigation actions, similar to what we heard from Thailand. Um, also having what we call transformative impacts, which is to not see mitigation um, in isolation, but to see it in the context of sustainable development, how to both scale up and have rapid transition. That's what we think is transformative. And how to achieve this is to develop the capacity for carbon transactions and engage private sector. With this, we hope to achieve um, enhanced climate action ambition through national policies, target setting, and all this is built on uh, knowledge, tools, and best practices, country-specific, but also sharing these experiences across countries. The SPARC program is structured um, this way, and we've shown it with numbers. It's over five years, four countries, five partners. In the consortium, you can see the logos here. Uh, three private sector partners, Carbon Limits, GFA, Comunal Credit, and it's all led by GGGI. And Marlin is from uh, ICI, funding from the, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. And the four countries are uh, Colombia, Pakistan, Thailand, and Zambia. We want to develop uh, pilot projects, at least eight, varies a bit across countries, and the total budget is 20 million euros over the five years. The activities consist of uh, six work packages. Two are global, those that the yellow and the blue, the community of practice is on the top, the toolbox is at the bottom, we'll do guides, and the middle, the most important, is the activities in the countries enabled by those two global components. So it's a country readiness program, and we will support three things, medium and long-term emissions planning, governance framework, infrastructure, institutional arrangements, and then the pilot projects, the mitigation activities. But the main thing is capacity building and knowledge exchange. The goals focusing on knowledge exchange is in three ways, to generate knowledge, to exchange it, and to apply it. So it is knowledge for action. We, and I'll, actually I won't go into the details here because the next slides ex, ex, uh, explain the details. This, this is the approach to, to generate knowledge. We support research. We call it a research-based approach, working with young people um, and academics, also the senior ones, to supervise the young ones. And we see this as a lasting way to build capacity, because it is in countries, working with the universities in countries, supported by the consortium of partners. Um, we want to identify gaps, particularly relevant to implementing Article 6, and to translate the research findings so that it is not only researchers who tend to read research journal papers in closed academic journals, but to make it more publicly available through policy briefs. 
and the students will present this so that they also learn, as Halal has explained, how to present findings in a way that is useful uh, to policymakers. And myself, coming from a research background, I, I have experienced many times how difficult it is to translate research like IPCC is doing. It's not easy uh, to communicate across disciplines. So then we exchange the knowledge in workshops, um, in events, national, regional, global conferences like this, and we publish papers. And we apply it through internships. So this is, as you've heard, um, not only re academia and government, but also very much with private sector. And those that we work with already have that experience. Um, for instance, taking uh, researchers from Zambia for a short-term uh, internship in Germany. It's, it's costly, but w w if it's useful, we would like to do it. Um, and then ensure that everything we do is relevant to government, to government policy. So these activities, and I will, you see that the four objectives are here again, knowledge generation, sharing, application. We're targeting uh, the graduate program, master level. We will identify lead universities to, to create a network in the countries expose them to the toolbox of topics for Article 6, find national experts to work with and the relevant government agencies, and then um, have the graduate students work on these topics with these people. And for knowledge sharing, um, the graduate students again uh, share their findings in journal papers, um, in policy briefs, with government and private industry. So we're trying to break down silos. Researchers talking to researchers, government to government, but we want to have more exchange across. And last, this is the early career program with the internships, and we think this is um, a lasting approach to capacity building. That's what we intend for implementation. The timeline is five years. We have, um, we had yesterday the launch of the community of practice. We will have an introductory phase with starting in Bonn in June uh, next year. And then we'll have three cohorts of researchers targeting a total of uh, 40 researchers. And the annual cycle is to find out who to work with, researchers and who in the consortium, and then they will apply October, November, and recruit the students the, um, doing the research. In, in the first half, we will develop the research, present it in the annual meeting uh, through mentorships. And then when the master thesis is done, we will, if possible, do journal papers um, and arrange internships. And then we repeat next year, learning from experience. So the annual event will, will be these people, we call them core partners, and then sort of active and more peripheral, being the global community, which is other implementing countries that could learn from the four and vice versa. It's the secretariat, the regional climate centers, the private sector developers, also from the voluntary carbon market, um, and the experts from other initiatives will have, this is a high level agenda, the presentation of research, discussions of best practices, and what are the topics for research for next year. And some of the other initiatives, this is not a comprehensive list, but it's just to show that there are a lot of Article 6 initiatives already, Spark being one of them. It is such as by the, the Nordic uh, NEFCO uh, and the Nordic Initiative for Cooperative Approaches based in Finland. The Swedish Energy Agency just like clicked from the Swiss government are purchasing credits, some of the early movers from the buyer side. We have the banks, the World Bank, uh, PMI, uh, Partnership for Market Implementation, Asian Development Bank, uh, Government of Japan, 
is creating an international partnership uh, of Article 6 implementing countries, also with the Secretariat, and, and there, are, there are many more. I'll stop here, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Karin. I assume that uh, that was quite a lot of information for, for the audience, but um, from my point of view, it was very comprehensive and uh, clear <laughs> presentation. And thank you also that you gave us uh, the overview about what's um, further ongoing on capacity building in uh, the area of um, carbon pricing and Article 6. Now I would like, uh, as uh, the, uh, the time is running, uh, firstly um, address uh, a question to Tarin as uh, I'm, I would like to hear from you what you have heard t today from the other pa panelists. Do you think that it would be important also for your specific, I mean you have an in-country perspective on uh, receiving capacity building support, but do you think um, that would be important also for you to have such a kind of internship uh, program in your area or in your ministry, for instance, uh, to yeah to develop uh, certain topics, um, or do you have also other experiences in regard to capacity building approaches that you would like to share here with us? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, from my experience of uh, capacity building, uh, like for, for CAPSI, um, actually we, uh, sorry, mainly we doing the training of trainers, and then uh, the trainers can uh, expand the knowledge uh, to teach and uh, do the trainings within the countries. Yes, but in terms of, um, internships and uh, from university candidate. Uh, from my experience from the ministerial environment, we, we do accept the student uh, from university to take internship, internship at our department. Yes, so which is a very good experience for them. Yes, yes I, I think that is also a very uh, important uh, approach to say that um, of course, we have to also to train the, the trainers uh, as they are a multiplier. I think that is also an um, important uh, thing. So uh, uh, now I would like to ask you, um, uh, I'm a little bit curious in, in regard to what will, what have you now planned with, um, what, what's your, I mean, it's li probably a little bit uh, too early, but uh, what's your, pro where do you think your professional journey will go no, now with these experience uh, you have made? Uh, will you continue uh, to work on, on the topic climate change? Uh, or what's, where would you like to go, how to say? Uh, thank you, uh, Marlene, for the question. Um, it is a hard one to answer on public, actually. <laughs> Um, so I would say um, there is uh, definitely two ways. I'll definitely continue being a practitioner, building on my experience, uh, following up uh, how we're moving uh, and accelerating climate action uh, in the world in adaptation and mitigation. Uh, but to be honest, also knowledge is really important. So uh, I'll be doing my PhD in climate change politics uh, shortly. <laughs> so uh, you asked that in the right time. <laughs> so uh, to be honest, uh, experience and knowledge are um, a weapon uh, to help the person um, to increase their impact uh, wherever they are in the world. Uh, there is different approaches uh, to acquire knowledge and uh, there is uh, many opportunities to get experience. So I think by focusing on those two things, um, any person can uh, reach where, uh, like the place they are heading to. Um, and uh, what I aspire definitely to increase my impact uh, and uh, leave uh, a positive uh, 
print and the word, um, not only um, because I want to do it, uh, it's because uh, we are all uh, human beings uh, contributing to the impact, uh, contributing to climate change, and we are the one that need to solve it as well. So we all have a responsibility um, to uh, work more uh, and uh, achieve uh, or reach uh, a healthier planet for the future generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So finally, I come to Karen. Um, my question is now in regard to, I mean, you talked about uh, uh, the, the, the program part uh, of um, uh, internship, um, but how will you uh, reach out to uh, the researcher, to the young researcher, how to approach them? As Hala told me um, uh, that she didn't know much about climate uh, issues and uh, Article 6, so how to... Uh, motivate and how to, to approach them that they are uh, willing to, to take part in this. That's a tricky issue, I think. Luckily, we already have some experience from uh, Pakistan and Zambia, which are the countries where UNIP C uh, are supporting. And in Zambia, we, we received a lot of interest from the universities. There was one who volunteered to take a lead role. We had not thought of that, so we thought that was a great idea. And uh, soon, one of my colleagues, who is, has been a researcher for many years and supervised a lot of master students, will go to uh, Zambia and do a tour. We, 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 we call it a road show. <laughs> so we want to introduce the opportunities of Spark and also say what kind of support we can offer, such as the internships, what budget is available, and um, expose them to, we know they're already very good experts in each their discipline, but in our experience, since Article 6 is a new topic, they don't know the implementation challenges. I think government knows. So we, we want to tell them, based on the toolbox, how can they help their government, and we are quite, um, I mean, we, we actually found also in Pakistan, it was not difficult to raise interest. Um, I think it was more challenging to manage expectations. <laughs> um, so we will, we will continue, and it's already a, a very good start we've had in, at least in those two countries. Thank you. That's interesting. So now we come to an end, but uh, I would like, uh, even though that we, um, our allocated time is, um, has run out, I would like to give the floor um, the, uh, uh, the possibility now to raise questions to the panelists before we close the meeting. So please raise your hand uh, if you have any question to the panelists. So I don't see. Yes, please. Hi, thank you so very much. Uh, my question will be just building on what uh, your last point was about setting expectations, particularly in Pakistan, because I'm a Pakistani citizen studying in the US, uh, myself doing PhD in mechanical engineering. So do you have any set target audience to uh, incorporate in the project? Would it be like the university graduates or would it be like the seniors, um, of course, to lead? Uh, just any lead on the expectations uh, and also like the concrete timeline for the launching of this thing in the Pakistan? Thank you. So we, we had an inception mission actually late October and we are planning for a kickoff meeting for Marlin to join quarter one next year. Um, so in terms of, of uh, managing expectations, we, um, we want to work with the, with the supervisors to begin with so that they can also help the students uh, explain what is feasible. And we also have to, you always have to consider the budget. To that extent, it's, it's to some extent, it's, we have so many ideas we would like to do fantastic things, and so would the partners. 
but you always operate within what is feasible and and that's the budget so and we still have to break it down so and when we when we know we will engage with the supervisors and the students so that we can prioritize together okay um, I think that was clear uh, yes please uh, in the back there is one more question Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation and for that very good idea. And I think that we really need in developing countries to build capacities and, and it's a good idea to start from young researchers. But my question, if we are working in Article 6, we need at the end to produce, if you can say, projects and, and ideas. And I have seen that you have identified some projects, but do you have in mind also an idea, even it's not fully you know, like the researcher to work with NGOs and CBOs where they, uh, by mean uh, that those people can um, work with the communities to draft uh, projects that may not be very big but maybe have an impact. But um, I am saying this because they have some experience of working with very small uh, community group working on the, under, um, the carbon market, the gold standard, and it's in a very small city far away, but I see that the impact was on not only the carbon credits that have been produced, but even the sustainability and the change of life and change of, of, uh, of uh, style for, for, for the beneficiaries. So I'm asking, are you going to engage uh, communities in your uh, project? Thank you. Thank you. Um, then communities uh, and NGOs, I think the local communities, um, they come in when, when projects uh, are starting to be developed. So we haven't done that yet. We're starting with, with um, working closely with government to help set up their Article 6 strategy and to also prioritize which sectors, which projects uh, can best help them implement their NDCs, where are the best potential for emission reductions. But not only that, and in Pakistan in particular, we know that the sustainable development aspects, also in context of the disaster with the floods, these things are super important. So we, you can't just do mitigation in, in without thinking of the sustainable development context. So the way we operate is to, to give tenders. Um, we call for proposals to, to work with national experts. And this is open to everybody, also to partnerships with, between private sector, uh, the researchers, and the, the NGOs. So in the past in CDM, we saw project development by NGOs. Um, just like when we partner, we are always stronger together. If you apply as an individual, you, it's more difficult. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, uh, yes, I think we have to close now. There is one more question. I, I give him just one more question and then we have to close. Please. I think uh, the speakers, my question is about uh, opportunity for uh, university, for example, Africa University. Thank you. Okay, um, will you, would you like to take that question as well then? So another example, an investment, if I understand your question correct, what are the opportunities? For instance, we meet a lot of people here at the COP. And yesterday I met two colleagues from a bank in Zambia saying they're very interested in supporting private sector developed projects because it, it takes finance and, in, and it also creates investment opportunities within the countries to um, yeah, invest in India and they can be expensive. It takes a lot of upfront investment if you do renewable energy projects. 
it's very heavy in upfront investments and you need finance providers also to understand what is the contribution from the carbon finance uh, perspective and possibly blend it with other types of finance such as the climate finance and from banks. So there are opportunities here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for coming and uh, thank you to all panelists here that you provide your thoughts here to the audience. I, I think it was really interesting and um, see you probably later today. I mean, there are also other very interesting uh, sessions here at the uh, Capacity Hub uh, during this day. Thank you very much. Bye. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Colleagues, could you please take your seat? We are going to start our session.
Panel members, could you please take your seats? Oh, Mali, you have to be here. Hello, hello, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the, the side event on the sharing of lessons on the implementation of the Article 6 and Article 13. Uh, there are colleagues which are virtually joining. L Laura, are you online? Okay, uh, let's start and then in due course we'll check whether our uh, resource persons are online or not. Uh, or just briefly, I would like to give you a highlight on uh, where we are and uh, in terms of implementation of the Enhanced Transparency Framework. Uh, as you all know, uh, parties have been, as per the guidance from Paris, parties have been uh, con communicating their updated indices irrespective of the impact of COVID. However, the aggregated impact of our indices are far below the intended goal of achieving below 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. Irrespective of all these limitations, countries have been struggling to comply with the requirements because uh, we are going to move from biannual update report into biannual transparency report, which is to be done in a more frequent basis, and it's going to be a challenge for most of the developing countries. And we are also expected to submit our biannual transparency report, the first one by the end of 2024. Uh, and the stock, global stock take in terms of checking where we are in terms of implementation is going to start next year. With all this, having a robust transparency framework in place across all our countries is a prerequisite for attaining the shared vision. And in line with this, uh, Global Green Growth Institute has been working with its member countries across uh, the world and focusing on specific countries, of course, uh, pilot and scale it out. But since 2015, GGI has been supporting countries in the development of a robust MRV framework supporting in the overall transparency framework in tracking their uh, action and support. So in this regard, there is a good start. So the purpose of this event is to share lessons uh, on our experience, especially focusing on our recent experience in the development of uh, 2050 strategy uh, work in Ethiopia, uh, building uh, MRF system in Burkina Faso, and creating an innovative train of trainees program in Myanmar, as well as uh, on the experience in the NFC roster of experts program. Uh, the mode of our uh, one hour session will be, uh, the first phase will be like question and uh, answer for with our distinguished panel members, and then followed by uh, five minute question and answer uh, from the participants. And the second phase will be three, 10 minutes each presentation by uh, three resource persons. With this, I would like to introduce, actually I have to introduce myself. <laughs> my, my name is Gabriel Jember. I'm regional lead on MRV and climate diplomacy at GGI Africa office. Uh, on my left side, we are privileged to have Ms. Helena McClard, if she's Deputy Director at the Global Green Growth Institute. And uh, Mali, uh, Dr. Mali Fafona uh, is the Director of Program for the African Program. And we have Miss Laura, uh, she's a country rep 
of Burkina Faso. Uh, she will she'll be joining us virtually. And we have Mr. Bunty Ferdesa, who is the director for MRV Systems Directorate in the Zen Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, currently EPA. Uh, panel members, welcome. And first, I will uh, I'll just like to move to the uh, questions. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Bunty. I have two questions. Uh, you know, you have been engaged in the development of MRV system as well as uh, LEDs for Ethiopia. You are you are part of the working group member. Could you please just tell us your experience uh, for capacity building uh, of the LEDs process as well as building the institutional capability in due course across the preparation of the LEDs. And you can also link with the uh, just tell us what are your immediate priorities once we have developed the LEDs? What are your immediate and long term vision in terms of really building the capacity of the nation uh, in addressing and full implementation of the uh, LEDs? Bunty, you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I will be brief on uh, the process of the LTS and uh, how the capacity building really going uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, as a national, when we are doing or developing the LTS, uh, we establish a team of experts, which is line uh, with from the line ministries and uh, engage them uh, from the starting point to the end process of the LTS development. In this development, uh, there are team of experts that uh, really engage in the process and so the team of the experts will uh, take each uh, activity data and uh, exercises how uh, the models, how uh, the tools and the methodologies are used before the development of this LTS, so uh, the engagement of the sectors of the experts are uh, a start or engage from uh, uh, from the from the scratch or from the end from the starting to the uh, uh, end point of the development. In this process, uh, the experts will develop uh, how the scenario of the greenhouse gas uh, calculation will be. Uh, then and how uh, the tools or the methodologies or, or the models will be uh, functions for uh, developing this uh, greenhouse gas emission calculations. Not only this one, uh, but also they also uh, engage in the cost benefit analysis of this LTS and how to develop or how to uh, calculate and uh, identify uh, the existing MRVs and uh, the scenarios. So, uh, regarding the second question, uh, the institutional arrangement is basically established uh, uh, as a national, which is uh, more facilitated by the EPA. Uh, we have a robust uh, functional uh, institutional setup, which is the CRGE uh, uh, implementation is really function, which means the sectoral approach. So all the sectors have their own teams who do their activity data and collect uh, the data and develop the uh, reports. And uh, so uh, the teams are more experienced in doing the activity data and the reports. Uh, regarding uh, the capacity building, we need, uh, in terms of uh, the short plan, uh, we need to move from uh, existing MRV system to the ETF. So we need to have the capacity building of, on uh, how this ETF really uh, established and what data are what existing uh, tools are important and uh, we need to have the capacity building on 
the, the, first implement, the first existing or establishment of the system of the ETF. Uh, for, for, for the long uh, time ETF implementation, uh, we need to have uh, establishing a sustainable institutional setup and we need to have the capacity uh, uh, for, for, for the implementation of this ETF and also we need to have the national uh, technical capacity building establishment. So, uh, in general, uh, for, for the capacity building, we need to have uh, the setup or the institutional setup capacities and the technical capacity building is for all the sectors. Uh, I think that is just what, what uh, uh, we are uh, doing as, as a national. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Banti, for uh, sharing uh, your lessons as being uh, an expert in the Marvi and working group member in Ethiopia. We'll come back if there are questions from other colleagues. Now, uh, allow me to welcome uh, Ms. Helena uh, to just to share us. From a uh, country's perspective, we hear about where they are, how they are doing things, and uh, uh, their message on how what needs to be prioritized and their testimonies as well, what has been done so far. So, like, the capacity building need is immense in the coming years. And our partners, I mean, like, we have been doing in a way we think should be the best way. But what, from the lessons from GGI being engaged in 30 plus countries across the world, what guidance can you give us how the partners should be coordinated, how they should implement capacity building in their, uh, their intervention uh, sites or countries? Thank you. So for those of you that don't know the Global Green Growth Institute, we work in about 38 countries around the world currently. And of course, all those countries are quite different in terms of their income levels and their specific country context. But in terms of capacity building, there's, there's a number of things that really can help. So our whole model is about being embedded with our country partner governments. And that means that our teams largely sit within ministries within the countries that we're, we partner. And sometimes we sit in multiple different ministries because climate change is a multidisciplinary area. And that means that the capacity building is ongoing. It's not a fly in and a fly out in terms of a workshop. It's actually a lot to do with learning by doing, so on the job learning. So for me, and I've worked in capacity building for 25 years. One of the things that I think is very valuable is to actually work on the job. So if we look at some of the examples that we've done around the world, one is um, working on the long-term mission development scenarios where we've worked in over 30 countries. In Ethiopia, for instance, we've brought together about 30 different professionals um, to develop that process working with us and they actually will be the ones that do the, the delivery of the substance. So it's not just coming in and leaving with all the knowledge. So I think the embedded formula is one really important aspect. But also, you spoke about the need and the scale of what needs to be done. And I differentiate in two, in two terms. One is technical assistance and one is capacity building. So for me, the technical assistance is when technical experts come in and they advise and they do a lot of the work themselves because they know how to do it. And I think that's absolutely essential at the minute because we don't have time to wait to build all the capacity to just let our government partners do all the work themselves. That technical assistance is absolutely fundamental. But the capacity building is also fundamental. So that incremental learning as you go along hand in hand. And I think for me, having that ongoing relationship is also really important. So we have this privilege in GGGI to work for many years. We can build on um, the work that we've done with our partners. And so again, it's not a short term intervention. It's over a, a, a number of years. The third thing I'd like to say 
is we work obviously with government partners, but in terms of capacity building, it's really important to recognize and that the ecosystem of knowledge in a country goes beyond government. So the private sector is absolutely fundamental in the green growth transition. The learning communities, the, the academic communities are essential. So building that broader ecosystem, even of the consultants domestically who have the knowledge to help when international consultants go, is really important. Now we do a lot of work even with leading commercial banks and they need capacity building because for many organizations, for many commercial banks, they also don't know how to do green growth. Um, so whether it's helping with economic models, financial models with leading commercial banks in Thailand on circular economy and, and waste models, or whether it's working with the, the financial institutions in Mexico to work out what the environmental and social governance standards should be, that is capacity building. So we're all learning in this new world and it's important to recognize it's not even the, the lowest capacity countries that we have to capacity build. It's everyone that has to be capacity built and we're all learning. This is a new world for everybody. Um, the last thing I'd just like to say is obviously it has to be tailored to the country context. It can be tailored to the income level. If you look at the Pacific, for instance, it's a very small um, numbers of people. So how many people are there to actually capacity build? You can't keep people in workshops all the time. The work needs to still be done. So actually supplementing that capacity with people who can help with the work in a collaborative way is really important. And then the last thing I'd like to say is there's so much opportunity for really significant technology transfer. So we've supported one of the largest issuances of floating solar PV, for instance, in India for 600 megawatts. That was a new technology to India. Um, so that transfer has been made across different countries and a lot more of that technology transfer can happen in terms of the renewable energy transition, for instance, or even water management and water um, efficiency uh, innovation. So technology transfer capacity building around that is also really significant. So whilst it is a challenge, I actually think it's really exciting at the minute. There's so much new in the world. There's so many innovations. And it's an incredible time to be able to live in the world and just learn from all the experiences and knowledge that are available at the present time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for your uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, uh, now I'll move to Dr. Mali as a director for and head for African program PGI. My question will focus more on African continent, which is more broader. But how, how do you estimate the urgent needs in terms of capacity for the African continent? And how, how can you estimate and interlink with the required finance for really addressing this capacity need? Uh, and then, maybe if you have time, how would you approach to make use of use in the capacity building program? Um, uh, for, for before I, I let you speak, uh, I, I would like to allow Elena to go because that's overlapping schedules. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Gebru, for uh, these questions. So as you rightly put, uh, I think the continent, there is a need of having a right transparency system in place. Um, and that linked to a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is also linked to how they can have really a rapid report that is quite important nowadays because we know that transparency also is linked to how they can attract more funding. That's one. The second thing is also linked to the quality of the report. Right? And when we look at the quality of the report nowadays, the big issues that and the challenge that the continent are facing is that how they can have the right updating data that can help them to have the historical of the emission. And the way to do so, you have to just put in place a good system and a robust system that will integrate, not working in silo, but having the integrated approach that you can work with different line ministries to put in place that system. And I think to do so, what Africa need um, basically is just how they can have a tailored system that trigger and help to track adaptation need in a certain way. Um, that also link to the need in terms of attracting finance. And let me just go more in details on that reflection. 
Um, one of the important things to say is that when we look at the case of Burkina Faso, uh, the first point was raised is linked to how the government can just reduce the working silo that they currently have in terms of like sharing the same information, sharing the data, because we find in those countries already exist a system that really require more support to come with a new way of doing things. And that more support come with a new way of doing this require capacity buildings that go from the decision maker, but also at the institutional level, how they can design the right format. So that's quite important to look at that part. Now, countries themselves also have to know how they can design their own capacity building program and looking for funding, which is probably the, uh, the other way around that we have you know, donors and coming with their own program and trying to build the capacity of the country. And the way to do so is that the country they should know how they can identify the need from all the transparency process and check with those needs how they can prioritize that and have a clear roadmap what they need in terms of designing a new LT lights, long-term low emission development strategy, and what is it required to put in place the MRV system. And that's need that conversation should happen and should take place with the different government. And with that, with that way, that will help really to have something really you know, adapted by the African continent and just specific per country where they are in terms of reporting regarding the transparency, if I stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Male. Uh, with this, uh, I'll move to the next panel member, uh, Ms. Laura. Uh, she is joining us virtually. Uh, from Burkina, you have the floor. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, give you just a highlight on areas for your uh, reaction on especially gender versus capacity building. How do you see the uh, interlinkage? Because uh, the gender issue is cross-sectoral. We need to have, we need to make sure that programs and projects uh, make sure that gender issues are addressed across in, uh, so that for that, capacity building is very crucial. And even the interlinkage between the need for capacity building for adaptation. So can you share us your thoughts on this? You have four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Gebru. I hope everybody can hear me well. And uh, let me know if there's any issue with that. So thank you for giving me the floor. So indeed, uh, the gender aspect is really important as we aim at inclusive green growth and, and climate policy at, at GGGI. And uh, I would like to present some concrete examples from our work in Burkina Faso in this regard. So the first thing, of course, is that you have to analyze the situation and context where you uh, carry out capacity building. And then you identify the aspects in which women may be at a disadvantage. And then you plan the specific actions to, to, to address these issues. And this also requires spending targeted budgets, we cannot get around that, to ensure gender balance in your capacity building approach. So in the context of Burkina Faso, uh, very few women have expert or senior positions in the, in the public ad administration, right? So this situation then requires specific and, and targeted actions to include more women as beneficiaries of capacity building activities and, and several approaches are possible. Uh, in GGGI's work to establish the national MRV system in Burkina Faso, which uh, is a project uh, supported by Sweden, uh, we applied uh, different means to increase women's participation in, in the capacity building activities. But for such specific work as, uh, as putting together an MRV system, you want to be sure that the people who receive the training are the right ones. So the persons who actually are in charge of uh, supporting the greenhouse gas inventories, for example, in the line ministries, etc. So, uh, and as I said, these people are mostly male. So what we did, uh, we increased the number of participants we invite from each institution um, on the condition that the additional people are women. So this way, we, we are sure that the right persons within the system come to the, the capacity building activities and receive the, the training they need. But also, at the same time, we contribute to slowly building up the capacity of female experts within those institutions. And um, we increase their chances of someday being in those key positions themselves. Uh, we also specifically mobilized female trainers for workshops. 
And there are some social conventions uh, that sometimes limit women's active participation or even their own, own perception of, of how relevant the training is for them, actually. And it's actually easier for many women to speak up and to, to take an active role, active learning role in an event if the trainer or moderator or, or whoever is leading the event is another woman. And a, a third approach is um, uh, organizing capacity building specifically targeting for uh, women. For example, in our MRV project, we have offered a statistics training specifically for female statisticians within the state institutions in Burkina Faso. And this approach can, of course, be applied throughout the whole program lifetime to contribute to the specific objective of strengthening female capacity in uh, climate governance. And uh, GGGI indeed plans to follow this, this approach in, in its future work in Burkina Faso as well. Um, with regards to my ideas on uh, capacity building for adaptation in, in particular, and again speaking from the point of view of Burkina Faso, uh, there's a need to decentralize the coordination and implementation of the National Adaptation Plan. And this means we also have to decentralize the capacity building and capacities. So in practice, this means that the sector actors and also the regional actors need to be brought on board as full-fledged partners in, in, in uh, adaptation. And in, in any case, it's in the end, it's them who are in charge of, of implementing the actual adaptation interventions on the ground. But there's kind of a gap between the adaptation policy coordination in the country and then that remains very centralized and then the, the actual activities. So our approach is to strengthen the country's readiness um, to receive climate finance for adaptation by addressing uh, the, this uh, decentralization issue. So we support the regional authorities to carry out regional climate vulnerability studies, first of all, and then uh, based on those studies, we will uh, target capacity building uh, to the actors that, that most need it within the regions. And um, we will also target private sector, which I think is very important, especially to help them access climate finance and to identify the market opportunities that um, adaptation needs offer. As an ex example, uh, we know that increasing renewable energy share in, in electricity generation, or for example, introducing climate resilient agricultural practices are uh, adaptation approaches that also open whole new markets for private sector, but they need to be informed about the adaptation policy framework and financial framework that is being put in place uh, Thank for, you. for Thank these you. actions. And yeah. then finally, of course, the key national yeah. authorities, government, uh, uh, they need uh, capacity building on adaptation. And I think the, 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 the key issues for them are really in seeing the synergy between adaptation act action and other objectives and outcomes such as mitigation benefits, the, the NDC, uh, as well as different kinds of um, development uh, development targets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So for, yeah. thank, thank you, you. Lara, uh, for the sake of time. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for your understanding. I took a point. We used to say decentralized finance. Now you came up with decentralized capacity building. I think that should be a good approach, which you, everyone needs to take into because our focus most of the time is at the federal level. And if we happen to have the right capacity, let's do a bottom-up approach. I think that's a good message. Uh, with this, I'll open if there are two burning questions before we move to the next session for our panel members. Okay, if none, it's, it seems it's clear. So we'll move to the next part of the session. We'll have three brief presentations. Uh, the first one will be on the uh, experience in the development of a robust MRV framework in Burkina Faso, which will be presented by Dr. Male. Uh, Dr. Male, you have uh, five minutes. Okay, um, I will go very quickly on that. So. Uh, what's happened is that in, we work with uh, the government of Burkina Faso when we started in 2016 about the necessity for the government to have a solid and robust MRV system. And the reason why at that time we raised that issue is that we was saying that it's quite important for the government to know regarding the NDC, the goals that link to the Paris Agreement, they need to have a strong, uh, let's say, system that can help them to track on the progress. 
So we designed together, not GGI side, but we designed that program with the government, designed a specific one, what is the MRV system, the national one should looks like. And that require a couple of, let's say, principle in details. One is just look what really exists in country, right? When I say what really exists in countries that we just cannot come and say we will build an MRV system and that's GGI building it. But what particular, let's say, initiative is already ongoing? For example, in Burkina Faso, we know that there was one initiative on AFALU with CBIT, but other one that's linked also to Red Plus with the forestry sector. But what we did as GGI when we arrived is say that, look, you guys are working on different sector, but we're looking at the missing sector and how we can support on that. And the missing sector was energy and um, in, uh, industrial process um, in certain way, IPPU. So, and when we use working on those two, uh, the main idea is that how the approach that the other partner, CBIT, are working on um, the other sectors, but also uh, the RED Plus, how we can come up with one particular and similar approach that can be easy and urbanized at the national level and can serve as one model. And that's why we work on the national rubber system at that time. So we work on that part, which is really a large component of our work. But the second part was really on capacity building. And one of the interesting things in Burkina Faso, and I think I will go more in detail later, is that uh, what we start first is just what we call the MRV rapid assessment which is really looking at the landscape and see exactly what, is, what have been done in the sector, what are the different needs in terms of institutional arrangement, what are the different needs in terms of policy and regulation, and have really a clear idea on the gap. Right after that, we develop what we call the MRV guidelines, because most of the organization or most of the uh, people from the government side, they need to know what is the know-how, know what is how we're going to implement the MRV system in country. And designing with the government the MRV guidelines help them to have a specific tools that they can refer to when they look at, we have to now start MRV. This is a different step that they would like to go forward on that particular element. And that MRV guidelines come with tools and elements that go with it, which is quite interesting. The second is just data. You know, um, when you look the way that governments is structured, you have every line ministry reporting to the prime minister, right? And they do not have some kind of cross-cutting data sharing because it's not part of the way of doing things. What we're looking in GGI is just how we can work with the government, having MOU signed between the different line ministries so they can share data between them. And there's a large implication of the national statistic agency because they do the collecting data, how we can help them to integrate that transparency framework within the uh, system so they can collect the right information and data at time. Um, there's also things that happen on a technical uh, capacity building. And the funny things when we start the first workshop, it was quite funny and I just asked a story. Um, we just joined the first workshop and there was a workshop on the building the capacity on data analysis. We have a room of 50 experts coming from different line ministry to doing the work, but there's no woman, right? That was the first thing I was saying, where, is, where are the women, right, normally? Um, and that's why we start designing a specific program within the MRV system dedicated to women working on the statistic uh, and data collection, which is really something that's quite important to also to integrate the gender system on that part. And that's why we target it within the national system, ask them to send us, you know, statistician women, build their capacity so they can run the similar things that men are running in another way but also finding a champion with them so they can run the specific things. So we have a specific that leadership element that go through, and that way we see a lot of you know, women working that, and they will ensure that the cross-cutting gender is there. So that's one of the things that we add on that. And the other things I would like to just share, which is quite important as linked to the MRV guideline that I explained, it's quite important that you translate the guidelines according to the context, right, and the need, the current system in place. You know, we have the IPCC default, uh, let's say, standard approach, but it's good to look how we can translate that at the national level. And that require a hand-in-hand -hand work with the government in these different line ministries to look at the process, what is the things that can be done and what are things that can be issues, and we develop that guideline from that particular element. And lastly, I think, uh, on the institutional arrangement. Data will flow when you work with government if you have the right institutional arrangement. And that's not something that you can change day one, right? You should have a clear plan on what you want to have in terms of like transition, 
or it's clear from the beginning that this is where we want to go in terms of objective. And that was something we set with the government at that period. And the lastly, in the sake of time, I will also go that we redesigned also with the government on the MRV system, the first IT platform that dedicated to the MRV in uh, West Africa. And where you have all the data that is collecting from the different line ministries and also help to have a systematic reporting site, not only at the national level, but also per region, right? So that's the, now the platform that the government is using and ask all the donors to put their data there so they don't be consolidated and help them to have a systematic report at the end in certain ways. So for listen, learn, I want to share. Uh, when you design a transparency system, and they need to be really close, uh, close look. One is just proper coordination. As a technical assistant or as a donor, you have to just put the government at the driving seat. So the government have to drive the process. And you have just to facilitate the process, not leading it. That really facilitate the, inter the, in the engagement with the other line ministry, but also interaction with the other ministries. The second thing is the national ownership. And that's why as GGI, we're not flying a fly-out expert. We're trying to build the capacity of the line ministry or the task force, and they will run the program themselves with limited guidance from our side. So the national ownership is quite important but because we're talking about building a national MRV system that need to be adopted by the government. So it's quite important to push that national ownership. The MRV system needs to be also sustainable. So it's just building, and we work with Burkina Faso for three years, now we have our exit strategy. They have to just take over and just continue the work without our support. And that's why that should to be really important. And the lastly, I think it's really are some really, uh, let's say, uh, gender champions in that. The gender equality is quite important. How you can integrate in the process mainstreaming gender needs also as some beneficiary, but also have a lot of people involved in the process that are women also leading some program. So those four lesson learned is quite important to take into consideration when you build that MRV system in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mali. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I think the way out should not be handover. So there should be some coaching exercise as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I'll move to the next presentation. Uh, we have virtually uh, our uh, Dr. Aaron Russell. He's a, a country rep for Myanmar. Uh, Dr. Aron, you have seven minutes. Hello, are you alive? Hello? Aron, are you alive? Okay, if Aaron is not online, well, let's move to the next presentation. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Aaron, are you? If we can, can you, uh, if you allow me to share my screen? Uh, okay. The next. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, perfect. We can see you as well. Colleagues, can you uh, display the PowerPoint, the presentation? Aaron? Yeah, someone will need to give me administrative access to share my screen. Or you can share the, the screen, the presentation that was previously uploaded. I think in the meantime, you can start just giving us some background why they are working on it. Thank you. If you can hear me now, I will, uh, I will share my screen. Perfect. So now I, you can I proceed. I will be brief? Yes, we can hear you. Just go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is, I'm currently the country representative for Uzbekistan. This is from our previous work in Myanmar. 
where we implemented an, a, quite an extensive uh, training of trainers program for MRV with the government, uh, with the Environmental Conservation Department, which is the, uh, the focal point for the UNFCCC as well as the NDA for the GCF. Um, the, so, um, and this went through a, s a series of phases. First, a training program was developed together with the government and with the Australian Volunteers Program to develop a curriculum of, and to implement that curriculum with uh, a, a large number of the Environmental Conservation Department staff. Uh, we, we did also additional trainings on climate diplomacy, uh, climate simulation games. We, we incorporated a number of tools and that have been developed by other partners as well in that process. The second year, we expanded that, having built some capacity within the government uh, into a training of trainers curriculum to enable them to be able to train their peers. And then we also involved them in implementing a number of technical assignments, assessing different sectors, the status of, uh, of MRV and energy, IPBU and AFOLU. And then finally, we launched the training of trainers program uh, and uh, trained a number of trainers who then delivered the training to the government, uh, to other government stakeholders. Um, this is an overview of the curriculum that was developed, a total of 13 modules. Some of it is introductory and, and general because it, it, one shouldn't take for granted that everyone has the same starting, starting point of understanding. Then there's very specific uh, information on uh, MRV uh, sectors. But we also, it was also considered quite important to link this with the SDGs. Um, and so we incorporated a number of additional tools and approaches uh, developed by others and with others uh, to in integrate uh, the, the government's uh, understanding of how to uh, report on climate change uh, together with their reporting for the SDGs and in terms of uh, assessing the priority needs. Um, this is just a, 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 some images of how uh, some of the lessons, some of the content of the different lessons that we, we developed in terms of what the different modules delivered. Um, these are just illustrative. Um, and I would like to highlight uh, and uh, reflecting on the comments made by uh, Helena and Male uh, prior to this, um, because we, we delivered this capacity building in, in an in embedded uh, context, we were there uh, with them and were able to support them in developing a number of additional technical deliverables um, because all pri most prior um, uh, interventions, the, the initial NDC, uh, the BUR, uh, most of the prior interventions and the national communications have been developed through a partner, uh, through, through some kind of development partner intervention. And increasingly, over the course of our intervention, uh, the government had took on was able to take on a greater responsibility and leadership in implementing uh, these analyses. Um, the culmination of which was that the government was able to lead uh, with, with with some support, but was very effective and able to lead a revision of the NDC, which was uh, submitted uh, um, to the government at the end of 2020, and which it greatly increased the scope of the government's commitments for mitigation and adaptation. Here's some, some pictures of the, 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 the stakeholders as we, we engage with them. I will highlight that the, there was a, a very strong gender uh, balance in the beneficiaries of the training, um, both of the training of the TOTs, the trainers, as well as the trainees. Um, within the, the government counterpart, the, there's a very good gender balance among the stakeholders. And I would like to highlight the, the, the importance of you know, again, as uh, Male mentioned, we don't want to fly our flag. Uh, this is for the benefit of the government. So uh, the role of the of the Environmental Conservation Department in particular, uh, DG Ulam Manthain, uh, Deputy Director San U, and Director San Win were critical for enabling this to happen. And you can see that the training certificate of Dr. San Win, who then coordinated the development of the revised NDC. In addition, I'd like to highlight the very important uh, support by the Australian Volunteers Program, who who really worked with uh, with uh, the uh, stakeholders on a day by day basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Aaron, for being in time and for having this wonderful presentation. Uh, there, I see uh, online asks on the sharing the resource materials. I think that uh, we'll consider it in the future. I mean, how we can share among uh, member countries and the other parts of the partners as well. Uh, with this, uh, I'll move to the uh, next uh, final presentation from uh, Ms. 
Hans Raji Sukur, uh, who is an MRV officer. Uh, you have five minutes, Hans Raji. Yes, the floor is yours. You can. We can't hear you. Hello, we can't hear you. Sorry. Perfect. Now we Why can I... see as well. Please go ahead. Okay. You have you have Great. five minutes. Okay. While a lot of the discussion has been centered around the requirements of most of the country parties in as it relates to capacity building and water requires, uh, my presentation today is presenting from a different perspective as opposed to what is required and more uh, from the perspective of an individual and what this capacity means for the individual. Firstly, it's centered on being on the UNFCCC roster of experts and what that process entails. Firstly, for anyone to be able to be on that roster of experts, they need to undergo an eight month, um, eight weeks training which is followed by a three to five days uh, window, which allows for the sitting of the exams relating to those training. And upon successful completion of that training, they're placed on the roster. It is important to note that currently, there are approximately 3,000 experts who are distributed across the globe, as you can see here. This distribution is split across Annex 1 countries as well as non-Annex 1 country. And importantly, there is also experts within organizations such as the FAO, UNEP, and even GGGI. This actually is a great win for climate change as it shows that um, these processes are not just driven by these international organizations, but are also being taken seriously by most of the governments and they're doing their part by training some of their experts. The purpose of the UN FCCC Rose of Expert is to conduct reviews on reports that are submitted by each of the parties. These reports included the annual submissions of the Greenhouse Gas Inventory, which is done by Annex 1 countries, national communications for both Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 parties, biannual update reports for the Annex 1 parties, and biannual reports for the Annex 1 parties, sorry, biannual update reports are for the non-Annex 1 parties. These biannual reports, as you will be aware, will be changed um, in the coming year and will be now termed the biannual transparency reports. The capacity buildings that are offered by the UNFCCC therefore prepares the, these experts to be able to review these reports from a holistic way and it allows them to have the knowledge and the tools needed to be able to critically look at the reviews that they are conducting following stringent guidelines pertinent for, to the training they would have received as well as to be able to identify areas of improvement for which the parties need to um, participate. While we have talking about what um, is required from the expert and their journey towards becoming an expert, it's important to note that despite most of this um, journey being um, pro bono, for example, these reviews are all pro bono, and it's a lot of time and dedication from an individual. There are opportunities as well to be had from both um, the individual from the perspective of professionals 
personal, organizational, national, and even global. These opportunities allows a person to contribute nationally to their country's national reporting, and thus a country dependency on international consultants, which has uh, usually been the case, may diminish over time. The opportunity of personal and professional benefits also include an individual acquiring a new qualification, for example, which can result in a promotion or even an increase in remuneration. Being part of the ROS allows for gaining experience as an ERT selected and comprised of a mixture of inexperienced and experienced um, experts. It's also selected based on various geographic locations from Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 countries across a gender mix. This allows for the inexperienced persons to gain experience over time while conducting these reviews. And it also provides a space with which like-minded people can discuss common topics such as climate change and saving the environment. It also provides an important space for networking. Oftentimes, these networking will transcend even the end of those review periods. While the opportunities provided by this um, being part of this expert review team, I just described maybe many, there are some benefits that last sometimes even a lifetime. As such, what is important is that while uh, many of us may look at capacity building as a need and more so as a job, from an individual perspective, it is more than just a job and a need. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me today. I hope this presentation provides a different perspective to look at capacity building instead of just being a requirement to satisfy a particular need or for a particular job. I encourage more persons to join Orosta as we do our part to ensure that we leave a legacy for generations to come. But firstly, we need to leave them a planet they can live on. We need to do our part. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hansar Jani. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, like being in this expert panel is really a good asset for countries as well. It's uh, one way of building capacity of individuals in due course institutions. So uh, I will encourage uh, parties to have more mem members of for the review uh, in the future. And with this, uh, before we close, if there are any questions or comments to the, our panel members as well as uh, presenters, we have uh, two minutes left. If you have any issue which you want to raise. Yes, please. Can we have the mic? Thank you very much for the very informative presentation. Awad uh, Abdelgadir from Sudan, uh, University of Red Sea. Uh, uh, if, um, <clears throat> how can we balance between uh, capacity building for uh, countries and the brain drain? Um, the, when we raise the capacity, we um, actually, a lot of these people uh, will not stay uh, under the, the stress. Can you highlight this point? Thank you. Thank you. Very important question. I think it should go to Dr. Male. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that, that was really a big issue because when you train individual and when we know in certain country, there is a moving from one line ministry to others, you know, and they go with that knowledge, right? So the way we, as GGI, are doing to overcome this, we're not no longer training one person in one line ministry. We ask them to have a task force, at least three people, right? So it's mean is one is just moving, at least the two others can continue the work. So it's mean that the, the knowledge is now shared among a task force, not only having one people, and that can resolve that, 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 that element. But nevertheless, the one thing also to have to consider is that 
when you train those people, there is train them on the particular skills. But how you can also go a little bit back, look on the academia, research center, or other uh, training, uh, let's say, center, train those people or well new, fresh graduated to have the similar skill to prepare the next generation. So you want to have more sustainable you know, uh, process in place, and that will resolve the issues. But there was really a big problem at the beginning, how you can just uh, avoid that you know, people moving from online industry or being hired by an international organization, there's no longer someone taking over. We now train a task force. That's why we ask to have a task force from the ministry and train the task force, not individual. Thank you, Dr. Mai. Next question. Yeah. Ruth Spencer from Antigua and Barbuda. Coming from a small island developing state, we always have human resource challenges. But I think a great effort needs to include local community people who are actually implementing many of these community-based adaptation efforts. But for some reason, they're not included. You know, and they have so much knowledge. So, you know, governments alone can't do it. They aren't meeting the targets for many conventions. And the all of society approach requires us to make every effort to include our local people who are filled with so much local knowledge that can contribute to the process. Thank you. And it will make the report more exciting. You know, they can probably have some case studies for different sections, but somebody has to reach out, bring them into the fold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very important question which you raised. I mean, we agree. Actually, implementation happens on the ground. Unless you build the capacity of the communities at the ground level, uh, you'll not reach anywhere. So that's why I was picking from the previous intervention from Laura. She was saying decentralizing capacity building. We should not remain at the federal level. We need to really work on the ground level in building capacity as well as engaging them in the planning process as well as in the decision making process as well. Yeah. Uh, with this, as we are running out of time, maybe if there are any final words, Aaron or uh, Hansaj, if you, if, you do, if you want. Aaron, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Aaron. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, we are not listening. We are not listening, Aaron. And then also, now, close now. engagement with NGOs and CSOs um, that to get to raise uh, local voices. They can't all be involved in the actual policy development, but the in in the case of Myanmar with the development of the new NDC, there was a very extensive repeated consultation with uh, CSOs and NGOs in the process. And I think that's quite critical. I think you're very right. Thank you. Okay, very much. just to complement what Aaron said, um, I agree. There is a need to include um, indigenous people and the local communities in these MRV systems. Um, speaking from my experience as one of the former MRV officers within the government before transitioning to GGGI. I note that there is an issue of um, capacity building that are being trained out of the governments. And here in Guyana, one of the steps that we are taking is indeed um, having more persons trained. And it is a hope that as Helena said earlier, we are not providing um, a service, but rather we are providing support to government to help them to build that capacity so that they would not have to depend on consultancies or even GGGI as much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. With this, we'll end the session. I would like to thank all the panel members, resource persons, the organizers, as well as uh, guys, for your patience, we are a bit late, but thank you for your participation. Thank you. This is the end of the
this Go, go first. Yeah, you go first. Oh, okay, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Michaela Chan, and I'm an assistant civil engineer at Arcadis, working in the water sector. Um, I'm also a UK youth delegate to the G20 this year. So, just to introduce. The Commonwealth is a voluntary association of 56 equal and independent countries. It's home to 2.5 billion members, and each member government has committed to the Commonwealth Charter, which includes joint and shared goals, such as development, democracy, and peace. As one billion young people live in the Commonwealth, the Charter also recognizes the importance of young people in the Commonwealth. As a result of this, the Commonwealth Youth Programme supports governments to implement policies which will benefit their young people. The Commonwealth Youth Programme engages with young people directly through the 13 Commonwealth Youth Networks. Today's programme is brought to you by one of these networks, the CYSU, the Commonwealth Youth for Sustainable Urbanisation, and its working group, the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Youth Action Group. 
This action group aims to bring together the work of the Commonwealth Youth Programme and CSET to increase representation of young people in the energy transition. So now I'll introduce Alash Fisho to just give a brief introduction of what the Commonwealth is doing in the energy transition. Thanks, Michaela. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us here today. And um, as Michaela said, my name is Alache Fisho. I'm a legal advisor and lead for the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Agenda. So a few key messages that, you know, just want to pass across as we start this discussion. One is that the energy climate nexus is clear. Energy production and use represents about two thirds of total greenhouse gas emissions and the tasks of delivering solutions that will achieve our dual goals of accelerating the transition whilst also um, transiting to clean energy systems will require strong engagement from across all society. Um, access issues remain critical. More than half of the nearly 760 million people living across the world without access to energy live in Commonwealth countries. Also, 2.6 billion people across the world don't have access to clean fuels and technology for cooking. Out of this, 20 countries make up 80% of this gap and 10 of those are members of the Commonwealth. So there's a huge energy access gap across the Commonwealth as well, which we need to support countries to close. Um, expanding energy access is a priority for sustainable development. What we're doing in the Commonwealth is we have put together a program called the uh, CSET, the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Agenda, which is a platform for collaborative action amongst Commonwealth member countries and partner organizations towards accelerating the transition to low carbon energy systems and achieving the goals of SDG 7. The agenda is focused on three key pillars. So we look at inclusive transitions ensuring that the energy transition occurs in a way that's just, that's equitable, and that is in, it's, um, it includes every strata of society, every country, big, small, um, rich and poor, and um, developed and developing countries are also catered to as we transit. Technology and innovation, ensuring that we have scalable technologies across the Commonwealth to support the acceleration of the transition and the enabling frameworks. And these are implemented through targeted approaches, including member-led action groups. Youth matters to the Commonwealth. Um, in her introduction, Michaela said about 1 billion people across the world are young people from Commonwealth member countries. So 60% of the Commonwealth is under the age of 30. And we're committed to investing in young people, placing them at the center of sustainable and inclusive development. It's imperative that we engage young people in the global discourse. And again, not just the tokenism that we see oftentimes, but really listening and implementing the solutions that are youth-driven and youth-led. So CSET Youth Action Group, which is co-organizing this session, is organizing this session. It was launched at the Commonwealth Heads of Governments meeting in June 2022. It's a youth-led initiative, and it's part of the CYSU network. Um, the Action Group already has over 100 bright young enthusiasts from across the Commonwealth, and it's focused on driving action under the three key pillars that I talked about, and also for driving youth participation in the development of policies and regulations for a sustainable energy transition. I'm also pleased to share that we have published a series of children's books on the energy transition. And these books are um, presenting the concepts of sustainable energy and why the transition is important in a way that's accessible to young readers. And I think we've got copies on the table behind. Please feel free to pick a copy, have a look, have a browse, and you know, speak to any one of us on the panel if you're interested in learning more about our energy literacy event. So just say thank you to everyone again and look forward to a really fruitful and engaging conversation today. Thanks a lot, Halache. Um, really good uh, overview of what the CSEC is about and how it connects to the CSEC youth. Um, so we're very excited to have everyone in the room today. Um, we've got really distinguished, and I mean what I say, distinguished experts, young professionals on the panel today. Uh, the thing that we're gonna be talking about mostly is how we transition in an economically viable way, carbon intensive markets and hubs 
and what the challenges are as far as doing that is concerned. Um, I started by saying we've got really distinguished experts here, and I meant it. Um, for instance, I'm just going to pick maybe a couple. Uh, Angelos here has installed over 20% of all the battery storage that we have in the UK, storage duration uh, battery storage, that's over 360 megawatts, being involved in some shape or form. Uh, so um, I'll pick Brian. Brian as well has done quite a lot of transitioning work for clean cooking in Africa, and each and every one on the panel is an expert in his rights or her rights. Uh, the reason why I started with that is there's always that thought around whenever we talk about experts and whenever we talk about youth inclusion and whenever we talk about how youth can contribute, it's always from a position of um, trying to build capacity, which is fantastic, but then also we have youths who are driving the limits on what new technologies are available, what sort of approaches we could use to really move the market forward in various ways. Uh, one of the things that we've seen as well is we see a lot of our members actually pushing also the regulatory side of things. They develop technologies, they develop new ways of working, and the technology, uh, the regulatory side of things is not mature enough to help them push the limits and actually get the most value from what they're presenting. So some of those barriers we're going to talk about in a bit, but we're going to be looking at the full value chain with a focus on one key enabler, which is storage, uh, both short duration and long duration storage. Uh, on that note, I will pass the mic to Angelos and uh, Josh. Thanks, Chris, for the kind words as well as the introduction. Um, could we change the main screens to the PowerPoint, please? Amazing. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I hope yes. So just to reiterate what Chris said, uh, myself and Josh operate in the energy storage industry, and we will be discussing how we transition the energy industry um, towards uh, net zero. Uh, so here's a, just a quick overview of the presentation we put together uh, for you this afternoon. Uh, we'll start with some brief introductions um, from Evangelos and I. Uh, then we'll review some, kind of ex some existing energy storage technologies that are available today. Uh, then we'll dive into short duration and long duration uh, in a bit more detail, uh, followed by kind of going over some barriers that, that may exist um, in implementing some of these technologies, and then finally a, uh, a call for action or um, how, how everyone can get involved. So just a bit of background about ourselves. Uh, my name is Evangelos Pasras. I'm originally from Greece. I come from a civil and environmental engineering background. However, I've been working as a project manager in the battery storage uh, industry of the UK. Um, I participated in one form or another, like Chris said, in more than 200 megawatts of battery storage facilities within the UK. Um, and I am here at COP27 um, with the Commonwealth Youth Programme and CSET, the Sustainable Energy Transition, as well as the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. Uh, and my name is Josh Weert, uh, originally from Canada, but currently working in the United States. Um, I studied mechanical engineering, uh, and I currently work as a project manager at a, a renewable energy maintenance company. Uh, and I'm here at COP on behalf of Breeze, a uh, compressed air pipeline, uh, long duration storage system, uh, something that we'll go over a bit later on in the presentation. So just to kick this off, um, we'll discuss briefly what is energy storage. So energy storage is the practice of capturing energy at its point of generation for its use at a later time. Um, there's various ways and types of technologies you could do this. There's, just to name a few without going into great detail, there's mechanical, chemical, uh, gravitational potential, electrical potential, as well as thermal or cryogenic storage. A few examples of these you can see on the right-hand side. We'll talk about a few of them um, in just a second. But before, I, before we do, I think it's very important to uh, clarify a bit on how you define an energy storage system. Um, there's two key metrics to define any storage uh, technology. Uh, the two terms are megawatts and megawatt hours, and it's really important to be able to differentiate between the two. Um, megawatts relates to the rate of discharge of the system, and megawatt hours relates to its capacity or the duration as we refer to it um, in the industry. 
in order to visualize it a bit more easily, the example I'd like to give is that of a water bucket with a, with a hole on the bottom. So megawatts would describe the size of the hole that's discharging the water from the bucket, while megawatt hours would define the size of the bucket, the capacity of its storage. And that's really key to understand when you are trying to uh, talk about the needs and the requirements of certain ele electricity systems. Uh, so energy storage uh, is incredibly important for uh, uh, the, the net zero agenda, as well as addressing several of the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Um, energy storage leads to greater grid balancing and system resilience, uh, greater penetration of renewables by addressing the uh, intermittency and generation issues. Um, energy storage also reduces um, wasted energy as surplus power uh, can be stored and utilized at a later time. Um, energy storage is also incredibly important for flexible supply and demand management, um, power supply security and resilience, uh, as well as energy autonomy. Okay, so into a bit more detail now, um, uh, let's talk about short duration storage and specifically lithium ion batteries. Um, if you have a phone or a laptop, you're probably using a lithium ion battery uh, already. It's not a new technology, it's something we've been using for a while. However, we only recently discovered that we can scale these up to, the, to accommodate the needs of the electricity grid. Um, specifically, lithium ion batteries can operate in various modes in order to provide services to the grid. We'll touch on that in a second. Um, the importance with lithium-ion batteries is their response times. As you can surely figure out, when you turn your phone on, within a few milliseconds, the screen comes on and you have power. This is very important when it comes to dealing with the intermittency of renewable generation. So as you know, the wind blows one time, at one moment, it does in the next, and so does the sun. And lithium-ion batteries come to accommodate this intermittency for the grid. It provides a lot of flexibility in grid management, as well as reducing the curtailment of renewable generation. This means, like Joe said earlier, that we're reducing significantly the wastage of green pro energy production. This, together with the ancillary services we discovered batteries can provide to the grid, are critical for reducing energy cost to the end consumer. And this is why energy storage and especially flexible and uh, quickly uh, responding technologies are important. This, together with a high, high round trip efficiency, which means we're reducing losses, and the modularity of the solution are very key components to their large scale implementation and deployment for these assets to enable the sustainable energy transition. Uh, so now I'd like to talk about a, a specific uh, long duration storage technology, uh, the compressed air pipeline system, uh, also known as CAPS. Uh, so a system like this is charged uh, via a renewable energy um, production methods such as solar or wind, uh, which powers uh, an air compressor essentially pressurizing a nearby um, decommissioned pipeline, um, thus kind of reusing, recycling that asset. Um, when you want to generate usable power from the system, uh, you run the compressed air through a turbine, um, creating, creating power. Um, an additional benefit to a system like this is the, uh, the length of the pipeline essentially acts as a transmission line uh, with the ability to charge and discharge anywhere along that pipe. Uh, so, there's, so there's many, um, you know, additional benefits to uh, a variety of energy storage technologies, um, but some other benefits uh, specific to, to the CAPS technology um, are actually byproducts of some of, some of the thermodynamic cycles of the system. Um, when you compress air, you generate quite a lot of heat. Uh, this heat can be used to, uh, to heat greenhouses, um, different manufacturing processes, uh, as well as, um, you know, food and beverage production. Uh, when you discharge energy from the system, and you run that compressed air through a turbine, uh, that drastic drop in pressure results in a drop in temperature, creating quite a large cooling load. Um, that cooling load can be used to, uh, to cool data centers, nearby data centers, um, produce ice, um, and then as well as uh, air conditioning for um, nearby homes, businesses. So, to address the main question of this session, how can we increase the decarbonization rate of our um, energy industry? As I'm sure people in the sector know, there's a variety of implementation barriers that we need to overcome in order to achieve the goals that we need to reach net zero uh, by the certain timeline that we know we need. Um, 
I will name a few of the barriers and then obviously the panel discussion will go into this in a bit more detail as, as well as the way and the steps that we can take to practically overcome this a bit more um, effectively. The first one that we've identified in the industry is financing and the visibility for investment. This is critical, especially for areas where the market is not necessarily proven and you need external investment to be able to deploy and deliver the, the assets that you need. This, together with clarity and visibility on the value proposition for this asset, is very important. And it's also important to note that the value proposition, when uh, taken to a certain investor or third party, needs to be uh, accompanied with some risk mitigation. This is to, to deal with the uncertainty of certain markets, especially when it comes to, in, to energy and nationally critical infrastructure. Because a lot of the time, when we're talking about large-scale uh, storage capacities, we are talking about nationally critical infrastructure. Um, the third barrier that often uh, prevents the uh, large-scale deployment of these assets is local resourcing. When we say resourcing is not necessarily the financing of these projects, which, is, uh, which tends to be the first thing that comes to mind. The resource also means human resource and capacity. Uh, we are in the capacity building hub at the end of the day. Uh, equipment and raw materials, as well as the knowledge and the technical expertise you need to make the system work, but also to operate and maintain them. So finding these resources available locally is very important. However, it's not always possible. And this is something that we need to uh, work on in the years to come and, and, and build our capacity and, make, and kind of allow and enable the local resources for these projects. Lastly, but not least, there's also the, the point around legislation uh, or the lack thereof in, in many instances. The legal framework tends to lag behind the industry sometimes. So it's very important when you are addressing the, the, the legal framework around energy, the markets on energy, to have a deep technological understanding as the expert, as the developer of this project, to be able to drive the legislatory change that you need to make these assets investment worthy as well as operational and you know, technically valuable to the community that they're in. So just to reiterate uh, key points, and then I'll pass it back to Michaela for the panel discussion. Um, it's very important from a project delivery perspective to be able to optimize the design and reduce the capital expense so that the investment opportunity makes more sense to a third party that might not be that attached to each local community. That's number one. Secondly, risk mitigation and some contingency for uncertainty is also very important. There are things that we know, but there are things that we also don't know when uh, delivering this project, so uh, contingency allows for that uncertain factor that might often uh, affect a business case quite significantly. And then lastly, um, as we have a, a panel of experts here as well, technical understanding of the, of the technological solution you're putting on the table is very important, both to inspire confidence in the ones that en are enabling this, as well as um, to drive the legislatory change that you need uh, to increase and accelerate an, uh, our energy transition. Um, I think we'll finish it there. I'll pass the mic back to Michaela, and uh, we'll talk through in more detail. Cool. Thanks very much for your great presentation, Angelus and Josh. Um, if we can just give them a quick clap. <laughs> okay. Um, so before I start the panel discussion, I just want to get the audience participating. Uh, can you put your hand up if you work like in a technical role in sustainable energy? at all. Okay, so you guys know your audience. Um, please speak to the people in front of you. Okay, so let me just briefly introduce the panel. So I think at the end we have Chris Chukunta. He didn't introduce himself, but he's the Vice President of International Renewable Energy Systems, and he's passionate about creating safe spaces for youth in the energy transition. Um, to my left, we have K Kembo Bryan. He's a founder of WEYE Clean Energy, which is a social enterprise empowering over 700 youth and women in Uganda to create sustainable and affordable energy solutions. Um, next to Bryan, we have Dominica Una. She's the registrar of the Astavent Energy Institute and head of programs and projects for the African Youth Climate Innovation Network. Um, Dominica is a clean energy enthusiast and a climate sustainability advocate. And on the end, we have Eileen Go, who is an international and sustainable development professional. She's um, working with the Commonwealth Youth Program and is a social entrepreneur in the circular economy space. So 
to start off with an easy question. Um, I'd like to ask everyone on the panel to briefly summarize what you think is the role of youth in the sustainable energy transition. Um, I will start with Chris. Thanks, thanks a lot, Michaela. So clearly, when you look at the workforce that we've got in the world today, majority of the workforce are youths, right? And in the next few years, we're going to have up to 70% of the workforce being youths. The most important thing I believe that we need to do at this point in time is to make sure every youth that has the ability and the willingness to contribute is given the opportunity to do so. All hands must be on deck. And uh, first, capacity building in every shape or form. But first, it's our responsibility to build our own capacity and then also take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. The second uh, thing I would say is, in terms of contribution, every opportunity that we could potentially provide within our spaces, whether it's government, private, public sector, we need to make sure the youths that are willing and able to do so are given those opportunities. And I think that's one of the underlining factor and underlining principle behind the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Team and Action Group. Cool. Should we just go this way? <laughs> Um, so, so I think, um, yeah, it's incredibly important to, uh, um, uh, to get the youth involved, um, you know, as soon as possible in, in uh, these kind of talks because, um, you know, obviously um, issues that, that potentially arise from climate change will be, you know, the youth issues to, to deal with when they're older. So obviously just, um, you know, getting, getting everyone involved as soon as possible um, so they can be educated um, and, uh, and learn to, um, you know, adapt and, and um, you know, correct some issues. Thanks. Um, so I think I'll, I'll see it more from the business or the technological perspective, right? because I'm, I'm in the sector as well. I think youth is, as we all know, a majority stakeholder in the climate conversation, and a lot of the times they are the ones driving the innovation in the, in, in the space. They're the ones driving the change that you need. Um, call it because they might be more uh, th thinking more outside of the box. They might be less heavy with baggage from long experiences in certain industries. Uh, but that's very important when we're talking about new technologies that are critical to accelerate the energy transition. So I think innovation is going to be my, my angle on this one. Uh, thank you. Um, I think when we speak about energy transition, we need to put the time element to it. So they, of course, it's not going to happen at one sweep. Of course, it's going to take time and therefore brings in the discussion of a succession plan, right? Uh, the, People, let's say above 40 right now, uh, will not remain 40 for the next 10 to 15 years, and therefore the workforce has to shift. And therefore we need to build capacity for you to fill that gap and then continue that plan to transit to cleaner technology. And so therefore that's when youth come in. And even like, the discussion of youth should also include even the, the, the children, because even the children like uh, Alasha introduced the book that actually is educating children from kindergarten, uh, primary, and high schools, because then they need to get the capacity to actually understand this before they get to university, and we give them terminologies they don't really understand. So it's, it's a transition that comes all the way from uh, kindergarten to uh, university, I guess. That's cool, thank you, Domenica. Okay, thank you so much. I think um, they've pretty much said uh, almost everything, but I'm going to bring it back home to Africa and uh, maybe Nigeria. I see the renewable energy industry as a young industry, you know, and um, it's an industry that has not been developed. If you look at the fossil fuel industry, it's really been developed and there is a lot of uh, um, capacity in that area and the renewable energy industry, especially in Africa, lacks capacity. So that is an area we need to look at. It also requires a lot of um, policy and youth engagement because you see a lot of people who are engaged, who are really doing a lot, developing um, work in this sector are older people. So the youth are not really involved in the renewable energy sector. So it, there has to be youth inclusion from the government uh, to the uh, policies and bringing it down to capacity building. Most of the young people don't know what is happening in terms of the technical aspect or the business aspect. So there must be um, uh, 
capacity building in that sector for young people in Africa, for them to really be engaged in what is happening. And also there has to be um, technological transfer. I know a lot of developed countries already have the technology, but in Africa we are still lagging in terms of technology. So young people have uh, the, um, the prerequisite to really capture the technology and bring it down to Africa. And um, also there has to be interest in terms of these people, because if we sit here and we are talking about the people, the government involving young people, and the young people are not interested in coming into the renewable energy industry, so there has to be um, deliberate interest and passion from the part of the young people. They have to be passionate and want to do things in this sector, and that could be achieved through um, awareness, creating awareness and letting them understand that this is the future for the, uh, this is the sector for the future, this is an industry for the future, an industry for the young. So they need to understand what they're doing. They need to, need to know that for us to really attend them net zero, there has to be um, intentional energy transition. Since energy shapes the bigger part of the net zero. So um, that's my submission. Um, for me, Wearing two hats from the policy side and also as a social entrepreneur, I would say the most important thing is for young people ourselves to look at the narrative slightly differently. So we don't want to, of course, making our voice heard is very important, but at the same time, we need to invest in ourselves. We need to um, change the narrative into a point where how can we as young people become solution providers? How can we be so needed by policymakers that we cannot, we can no longer be ignored. And I think, um, I mean, of course, as a social entrepreneur, and I think um, some of us here in the panel are the same, um, when it's difficult to transit that way, it, it, it took me very long, you know, to be courageous enough to take the risk. But when you do that, you realize that the conversations that you have with the people around you are very, very different. You start to talk about what can be done instead of, I need somebody to do this. And when you do that, um, it's no longer about how young you are, how old you are, but really what value can you bring to the table? And that is power. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Those were very inspiring words. Um, so I think one of the themes that a lot of you drew out was about social entrepreneurship, but also an inclusive energy transition. So I would like to go to Brian and hear a bit more about your work in the clean cooking sector, because I think it's something we don't talk about a lot um, in terms of energy transition, but it is something that affects a large po like proportion of the world. Uh, thank you so much, yeah. Um, I remember when I was attending the clean cooking forum this year in Accra, um, Damilola, the CEO of uh, Sustainable Energy for All, mentioned a statement that resonated with most of us. Uh, clean cooking has always been the stepchild of the energy transition. It's not something most people want to really talk about, or probably because there are better technologies to talk about, because most of the time when we speak about clean cooking, the first um, thing that comes to mind are the stoves, and, and yet it goes beyond that, right? And so, as we witnessed at the Clean Cooking Forum this year, we have, clean cooking has gotten more light, right? And there's more financing coming into this sector. But then the challenge then becomes how do youth fit into this transition, right? Um, because then we need to build the capacity for youth to come take this space. And in my organization, in my uh, social enterprise, that's what I'm trying to do build capacity for youth to actually know how to like, produce such technologies, stove technologies, produce uh, biofuels, produce uh, biomass fuels, right? And put them in the position where they have a product to sell within the market. That's building capacity for them. Also building capacity in terms of education, giving them the knowledge, the terminologies that they can use when they are going to pitch for financing because now financing is coming into that sector. So how do they access that financing? And how do they find it? Who to talk to? And so that is one of the aspects that I'm really, really passionate about. But of course, then leads to the policy, right? 
um, which is something also still lacking within, especially the African government, which uh, Alasha mentioned make up a lot, a bigger portion of the Commonwealth. So we need to f maybe work along with the Commonwealth to help change this policy, and that's why why we have these youth networks like C CSET, right, to help guide. To, to make policy recommendations for governments to actually help create better policies that will enable youth to actually get included in this. And of course, for policy, I will leave it to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um, so you raised a really good point about investment. And I think when we're talking about social entrepreneurship, investment is a really big um, topic that we have to talk about. Um, so I want to direct a question to uh, Dominica. Um, what, how can youth influence policy and like allocation of funding to ensure that we have a sustainable energy transition? Okay, um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I like um, still bringing back home to Africa because I'm not gonna speak for um, the globe. So um, in Nigeria currently, I would like to just read um, a few statistics. We are currently producing about um, six gigawatts of power, and um, out of that, 80% is coming from the fossil fuel, and um, we have over 90 million people who do not have access to power, and out of those 90 million, Nigeria is about uh, 200 uh, million in population. So we see that um, we are still far behind when it comes to access to power, not to talk of um, clean uh, energy. So recently, the Nigerian government launched the energy transition plan in order to get Nigerians connected by 2030 and also working towards uh, net zero in 2060. But how is this going to be possible? Because I look at the energy policy in Nigeria, it's not really clear, you know, we have a lot of policies, but uh, none of those policies are really um, constructive enough to say, okay, this is what uh, the consumption is, this is the con um, distribution plan, and um, this is the production plan. So that has to be recalled, you know, we have to sit back and look at the policy that would um, clearly state the legal framework of what is going to be done to achieve the energy transition plan. We have to look at how the processes that should be involved and um, the infrastructure. You know, there are a lot of um, people um, pledging finance towards achieving this plan, but how is that um, finance going to be um, distributed for people, for developers to really do the work? Because at the end of the day, it's not the government, it's not the policymakers that are doing the work. There are other people, private sectors, who are doing the work. So how are they going to get them involved? There has to be a clear policy for people getting involved in achieving uh, this um, energy transition plan. So um, in terms of the finance, I think um, I would like to say it here, a lot of international organizations, they come to Africa, they want to give funding for uh, um, energy projects, and what we were talking about yesterday was how simplified is the process of getting the, f the finance. Because if you're coming with money, okay, use this to do this, and the process of getting it is not clear, and the process of maybe um, getting the grant is not simplified enough, a lot of people are not gonna get it. It's difficult for people to assess this grant and this funding to be able to really do good. So that process has to be simplified for a common man, because like I said earlier, the industry is young, especially for Africa. So a lot of people do not have the, the, the skills of doing this, putting uh, these proposals together to be able to assess this funding. So that has to be simplified. And another thing is when the finance is coming, how is it being distributed? Uh, most of the things I've seen in the sector is, um, for instance, they come and they give the finances to um, commercial banks, and these banks use it for other purposes, not for what it was intended for. So that has to also be looked at. So if there is a policy or a framework that says, okay, if this money is coming for energy transition, it has to be used for energy transition. And then there is an evaluation um, scheme to monitor 
what is being done and uh, making sure that that money was used for that particular purpose. It will really help in um, this energy transition plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question um, before I hand over to the audience for any questions. Could I add something onto yes, the investment bit, if it. that's okay? Um, because you spoke about capacity building and being able to formulate these investment proposals in a way for to attract investment. Um, this links very nicely with the benefits that the youth has compared to previous generations. So the youth nowadays is a lot more connected than two, three generations ago. Call it the internet, call it technology, call it different upbringing. You know, we, we grew up in a globalized society at the end of the day. Um, I've, in, in the last couple of years or so that I've started trying to do my own thing, I've realized how important it is to network. So this capacity building that you refer to, at least the part of the world that I am from, normally refers to like an MBA or a degree in something or somebody giving you training to put a business proposal together to go to a bank or an investor and try to attract that, that attention and that funding. A lot of times, your network, your immediate circles can give you some tips, some advice on how you could do this without necessarily having the academic theoretical background as to why it needs to be done that way. And this is very important when you're trying to raise capitals for energy because, like we said earlier with Josh, we are talking about capital intensive nationally critical infrastructure. So we're talking about big sums that are essential for the, the community. So I guess from my perspective, one point for the young people, the young entrepreneurs, businessmen would be speak to your network. Don't be afraid to communicate your ideas. You know, there's this preconception that if, you, if I say what I want to do too much, somebody might steal it and take it away. But what I've learned is that it's actually the opposite. There's people out there that are willing to help you or at least give you, point you in the direction that you want to go. Um, so that's, that's a big part in my opinion. The second, if you're trying to get into business is find a mentor. If you are a young person that you are trying to start your own thing and make a difference, find someone to guide you in the way. It can be you know, someone in your local community. community. It, it could be somebody you admire that you've run into online and you just reach out. So I think, I'll, I'll just close off with this. Don't be afraid to communicate what you think you need to build your own capacity, and eventually you figure out the way. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, thanks for bringing that other side of the funding question as well. Um, so, yeah, as, as I was saying, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to note them down, and I'll come to the audience after this next question. Um, so my last question is to Josh. Um, so we're talking about an inclusive energy transition, um, but a lot of the time when we talk about clean energy, we're not talking about the impacts that mining of critical raw materials can have on communities far away from where we're talking about our clean energy transition. And I was wondering if you could give a bit of background about the issue and how the industry is aiming to tackle this. Yeah, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so generally speaking, um, lots of traditional en energy storage methods, um, such as batteries and whatnot, are fairly uh, material intensive, um, require quite a large quantity of um, you know, spe precious metals, um, which have um, their own concerns in, um, uh, in mining those processes, lots of emissions in, um, you know, involved in, in, in just harnessing that, that material. Um, one kind of additional benefit to the, the compressed air, uh, the CAP system, uh, is that um, the power is stored in, a, in an existing asset, um, a pipeline that's already been installed. Um, so it's um, you know a, a use of a, a essentially recycling that 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 pipeline, using it for a um, a green alternative. Um, so um, a system like that doesn't necessarily uh, need um, you know any additional um, precious materials. So um, kind of eliminating that 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 issue from the equation. So. Um if I could add to yeah, that. Yeah, I wanted then. to jump over to you as well, Chris, to hear your opinion. <laughs> so, for CAP system, clearly the, the system, the infrastructure is there. So, basically what you're doing is you're putting in, like Josh has said, you're using what is there to get huge value and return. And by the time you compare that in terms of impact on the environment, it's, uh, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Going back to pull out a pipeline is going to impact more on your environment than utilizing that pipeline for at least another 25 years, and then you're using that pipeline as storage to give you compact and dispatchable power supply. There's no question. The other part of the thing I would like to add to that is, 
I'll use an example, because there's quite a lot of misinformation out there. Um, if I installed, say, 10 kilowatts in a home, the impact of getting the say, solar module that you need for that is only about six tons of uh, coal. When you translate that to, um, to carbon, it's about 15 tons. It's about 15 tons of carbon uh, CO2 equivalent per year. But then for 10 kilowatts, for instance, in Edmonton, where I live, you're going to be generating, on the average, say, 14 megawatt hour a year, which is about 6.5, excuse me, which is about 6.5 ton of CO2 equivalent per year. What that means is within two years, you are knocking out any, and this, what I'm talking about is when you use coal, which is like the worst way of getting those models produced. You are actually taking out all of the carbon that you're using for producing that system. In the first two years, the rest of the life cycle of that system, it's taking carbon out of the year, six ton of CO2 equivalent, more than every year. Now take that over 23 years, and that is the warranted life of the system, which means it's going to live way longer than that. So there's quite a bit of misinformation in terms of value and costs as far as CO2 emissions is concerned. And also, sometimes I think the environmental impact is often overstretched as well. So there is no question about benefit for the solar industry, for instance. And then you can have those scenarios played out in a lot of the other renewable energy systems as well. So just wanted to touch on that. Thanks. Cool. So, um, yeah, handing over to you guys. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Um, yeah, at the back. Are there microphones to go around? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nancy Wanja. I represent the voices of the youth from Kenya, Madar Islams to be specific. So today I wear two hats, one of a youth advocate, the other one of an innovator. I run a social enterprise called Motobricks Limited. Motobricks Limited pro, uh, provides uh, Madari residents with renewable energy in the form of organic briquettes produced from organic waste. Now we are talking about youth inclusion. Uh, number one, uh, sorry I forgot your name. Chris. You mentioned about youth's willingness. So looking back at where I come from, uh, when we talk about the youth's willingness to be included in this course, it is not really wanting. So I'd really like to have more conversations on how we can have these youths, uh, bring them on board and uh, make them be part of this global course of action. Uh, we are talking about creating awareness. I feel that Creating awareness is not enough. There is more to it than creating awareness. So after creating awareness, how do we support their local innovations, their local initiatives, their local ideas? How do we support them? So uh, my other question is that, uh, is the government or the globe ready to invest in the youth? So after the youths are educated, after, after the youth have been encouraged to come up with the innovations, who's going to support them? Thank you. That's a fantastic intervention. Thanks for that question. So the first question about willingness, I think, is apt on point. Um, and that was why I was very intentional. So there's one element which is willingness. The other one is that need to make sure that whoever would want to be willing but is not having the capacity is given the opportunity so that the person can actually move that step further to be willing and actually contribute. So it's a fantastic intervention, and I take that on. The second point you raised about um, what sort of avenues are out there for whether in government or in the private sector for youth to actually contribute at, I think is also apt um, and that's the reason why you see the members of the CSET, uh, Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Youth Group 
on stage here at the COP talking about, hey, if you're willing and you're able today, raise your hand and join us. Uh, at the end of this conversation, you're going to see on the screen a QR code where you can just take a picture and join uh, and actually contribute. There's so many ways you could potentially contribute. There's a long list of options as basic as changing, you know, the lights that you have in your home to an LED bulb and those trickles actually form a mighty ocean at the end of the day in terms of impact. The other thing I was going to mention in terms of capacity building as well is Angelo said we live in a world where we are so interconnected and the opportunities that we have to grow our capacity is so huge that if we only open our eyes with a lot more intentional decision to change and improve ourselves, the opportunities out there are really enormous. Um, I started a company not too long ago, um, about four years ago, moved that company to, the, to Canada uh, just a year ago. And some of the things that I've been able to do because I moved in from the oil and gas industry from a technological standpoint are things that I learned by myself and things that I just went online and Googled and picked up a few courses and I learned how to do them. And right now, if you see me having a conversation with technical experts who've been there for like many years, I'm able to come to the table and have a technical conversation. I think anybody can do that. That's what I believe. So, I think, of course, you also ask the question, what about those who don't really have access to the internet facilities and all of that? That's why within the C sector as well, we're producing books. I actually talked about some very useful books that we're producing so that you can actually have a quick look to have a basic understanding of what things to look out for and how to approach it. I don't know if that's has a question. Yeah, uh, um, go for it. Uh, thank you so much. I think Chris has um, touched uh, most part of what I wanted to say, but uh, since I think I have a fair idea of what she's talking about, I would like to uh, maybe be very precise about the things you can do as a young person in the energy sector. For instance, number one, you, like she said, she's a CEO of a company that is producing briquettes and all, and if you are doing it on your own, their organization, if you can reach out to the uh, Ministry of Power in your country, for instance, in Nigeria, we have the um, Renewable Energy Agency, and they have a lot of grants and fundings for um, young companies like you, yourself. So you, if you can reach out to them, your company might not actually be qualified for it, but what we do is, in Nigeria, what I advise the young people to do is to form a synergy with other bigger companies so if you just started and you are not qualified for those grants, you can get companies who are already in a good standing with them and work with them. There is always need for integration, especially in this sector. So you can't do everything yourself. So you have to look for those who are already in the business and work with them. 1% of something is better than 0% of nothing. So you can work with these other bigger players and um, do your part. They can help you apply for the grant. Like in my company, STVN Group, what we do, we have the, the, all the documentations needed. So we call young people in Nigeria, young companies, to apply for those grants through us. And when we get it, we let them come in and do the job. We get the money and we fund them. So I believe in Kenya, there are companies like that who might be willing to do things like that so it's just for you to network with people especially here look for go to your pavilion network with people in that industry and get mentorship just like you said um angelo said mentorship is important especially for young people coming in thank you um i think we have time for one more question there's a question here okay maybe two but uh, can someone pass the mic Good afternoon, panelists. My name is Goodness. I am a 29-year-old Nigerian. Um, we are talking about capacity building when it comes to clean energy. In my country where we have the issue of exchange rates increasing and then taxation by the government, and then we have a young, um, young man or a young guy trying to produce most of this clean energy. And then he is faced with the challenge of importing these technologies and this equipment. And also 
been taxed by the government, how then can he develop? How then can he um, build his um, system that will help communities? Because this is a very big challenge for us in my country. So I don't know if maybe there's any means that you think he can actually achieve more with what he's doing. Thank you. Um, I, that's, a, that's a really good question. So uh, one, of, one of the challenges I, I, I faced when I started uh, way clean energy in Uganda is um, the machines I required to produce briquettes like my sister there were to be imported from India and China, right? And bringing them into the country, I faced a lot of taxation, like a lot of taxes and fees that I didn't even account for in the beginning, right? I did my research, but some surprised me, right? So you find that that happens. Now, one of the, the key things we have found really, really useful, there are already existing associations within all countries, Nigeria, uh, be it Kenya, be it Uganda, that are in those sectors. For example, we have the Biomass Association in Uganda. We have the Solar Association in Uganda. And I think Kenya, also, I mean, uh, Nigeria must have some of those. And they are so powerful that they can actually lobby for tax exemptions and uh, also maybe lobby for, for like free space for youth to actually get like, there are government facilities that can give youth space to operate, right? So you need to liaise with them. You need to join those associations and then present your position through them. Yes, there might be a, a fee there and here, but then it's worth it because in the long run, they take a lot of this burden from you. And also they advise you according to the country's regulations how to then go about some of these tasks and problems, right? So find that association and join it. Thank you. Well, um, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for a final question, but I'm sure our speakers will be happy to network with you um, outside afterwards. Um, so I just wanted to summarize the discussion that we've had today. Um, from the presentation that Josh and Angelus gave, um, the three key takeaways on next steps to overcome the barriers. Um, so the first one, optimization and reducing capital expense. Second is risk management and mitigation of uncertainty. And the third is technological understanding to drive legislative change. But I think what I've found as the overriding message from everyone today is that the importance of networking and building the connections and being part of a wider group of people all striving towards a clean energy transition. So I encourage you after this to really get together and speak to the people around you to try and see what you can do. Um, can we move on to the next slide? And I'll hand over to Eileen just to close. So we talk a lot about um, networking. We talk about um, being able to share your ideas, your voice uh, generously, and to meet more people um, like mentors and peers. Um, so we, all the people that you see up here, the young people, um, they are experts, but they are young. And um, if you want to meet more people who are as diverse as this panel, because diversity is really key when you want to bring um, test your ideas, um, we encourage you to scan the QR code. The one on your left would be the one um, on the Commonwealth Youth for Sustainable Urbanization, where you will also find details about the CSET Youth Working Group. And if you are more interested in, in, in other thematic areas that the Commonwealth covers, um, you can scan the QR code on the right. So we invite you to um, be in touch with us, and we will be more than happy to speak to, to you after this. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, panelists. Have a good rest of your COP.
So we will soon uh, start our next event on transparency in agriculture and land use, on learning from countries. I'm Marcel Bernou from FAO. The panel, some of our panelists are still coming. We are still figuring out where the room are, so it's still, so I bear your patience for one or two minutes, no more. Thank you.
atención. I see you in the screen. Okay, we will start. We have already one. You, you have the name? Okay, so it's cold start, but we will soon wa warm up that cold atmosphere. So thanks you, all of you, to join up here for that, that side event on transparency in agriculture and land use, so very specific and very important for that COP and in the current context, where we want to share experiences from countries. So here, basically, we will present different aspects, what is happening at the country level on work related to capacity building, implementing transparencies, different projects, what are the lessons learned, and also perhaps we have also colleagues online that are involved in a global coordination project on AFOLU, agriculture, forest, and other land use. So I myself, I'm Martial Bernou, so I'm from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. That side event is organized with all our uh, partners in the countries, with Yungo also. Uh, normally, we will have uh, at the end Elizabeth Gulugulu, that is a global focal point for Yungo, that she will also bring the perspective of what are their expectations in that transparency that some time can appear for your people a little bit complex, what it means. Uh, perhaps I will just ask my colleague on, online, Mirella, if you can hear me, if you can perhaps be on the screen and just present briefly the global, but very briefly, the global project on AFOLU, on how many countries you are supporting, the role of the coordination, but please, five minutes. Mirella, can you do that? Thank you very much, Marcial, for this opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really sorry that uh, uh, something uh, is, uh, uh, is happening. But uh, OK, let me, uh, let me just uh, describe a bit uh, the work of at FAO on uh, transparency and in the agricultural sector. So actually right now the most uh, uh, financing donor for the support uh, from FAO is uh, from the Capacity Building Initiative Transparency uh, Fund of the GEF. Uh, so in FAO we build a portfolio, uh, a portfolio of uh, two uh, global projects uh, one project is uh, fully oriented on uh, covering the CBAT forest, it's called, uh, looking in particular on the transparency of data of the forest sector. Uh, as you can imagine, one of the most challenging uh, sector for definition of the emissions uh, for the country. And uh, on the other side, uh, we have also the global project uh, that is called the CBAT Follow project that is uh, looking a little bit more wider in supporting the country in addressing all the reporting requirements uh, under the Enhanced Transparency Framework. Um, the two projects, uh, they've been also uh, co-adivated by a, a bigger number of 16 national CBIT projects where uh, the, main, uh, the main issues has been to address the reporting requirement of the countries in addressing transparency, not only in the mitigation sector, but also on adaptation. So, uh, and not necessarily we look only at the follow sector, but also we try the, uh, to see the overall picture uh, because one of the main objective of the CBIT project was also to try to start a setting up a proper institutional arrangement for a sustainable reporting uh, uh, procedures in the country uh, in order to be able to address uh, the two years uh, uh, requirement of the BTR. Uh, reporting needs. 
after uh, December 2024. So that is uh, what we have been doing. The, the global project has been supporting also several other around the 40 countries with uh, several modalities. Uh, we have been developing many tools uh, and uh, we have a proper website dedicated in FAO with uh, uh, most of the tools that we've been developing. We have been covering many countries, uh, providing uh, a sort of mentoring, one-to-one uh, -one support in addressing country-specific challenges in overcoming uh, their, uh, their main concern and constraints. Uh, in order to address uh, the, uh, ET, uh, the ETF requirements. So um, over on that, we build also the Transparency Agriculture and Land Use Sector Network. And we set up also a, a webinar series where we touch upon all the section of the MPGs in order to provide uh, some guidance to the country on uh, how to address and, uh, and also to uh, read in a slightly different modality um, the, the MPGs. Uh, we have been working uh, really also in uh, uh, supporting uh, academia and, uh, and the youth in the process. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Elizabeth is uh, there, uh, if uh, she can talk on that or uh, she, she's should here. I proceed also on that component, Marcial. Okay, so, thank you, Mirella. Uh, and then after we can also share uh, the, the link uh, of the different project on, uh, with the different also pro product output that were done on uh, so far. So we already have a, a, a country with us and we have uh, also uh, Yungo. So I, I will call now uh, Mr. Muzaffar Shodmonov. He, he is deputy head of the Center of the Study of Climate Change on the Ozone Layer for in Tajikistan, please can you join? And we have also Elizabeth Gulugulu, she's global focal point for Yungo, please. And we will start and the other panelists are on their way. So I, I will start perhaps with asking to Mr. Sean Monov, if you can share the experience of the CBIT at your country level on its very open question, what it uh, was uh, do, what was done, and eventually also if you see where we can eventually make more progress. So the floor is you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor and thank you for inviting me in, a, in this event. So regarding the preparation of Tajikistan on the CBIT side, uh, we are working with FAO, closely cooperate with FAO, and uh, we already uh, developed uh, the PIF and submitted our project proposal on CBIT to the GF, and now we are preparing the full project proposal. Uh, regarding the stakeholders who were involved uh, in this process, so the stakeholders are mostly the line ministries which were involved in the preparation of the national communication. And even uh, under the preparation of the NDC of Tajikistan. So several meetings were provided for the national stakeholders uh, on the national side. Uh, together with the FAO we organized a lot of consultations and the workshops. We just explained to people the aims of the CBIT and uh, most of the line ministries and the agencies already know about that, uh, that uh, the last processes of the inventory of GNG was done under the NC and they were close, uh, was closely cooperating with the UNFC focal point of Tajikistan. Uh, so the UNFC focal point in Tajikistan is the agency for hydrometeorology uh, under the Committee of Environmental Protection. And uh, in, uh, in regular basis, we prepare our uh, GNG inventory. Of course, uh, we have some gaps and problems in capacity building. And I hope under the CBIT project for future, we will uh, uh, like consider these issues on the capacity building. And uh, one more thing, when we were developing the NDC, again, together with the FAO and NDC partnership, we, we were revising all our inventory uh, we revised under the new methodology under the 2019 refinement uh, 
of methodology 2006 and uh, we use the new, the software of the IPCC. We, of course, with the international support, we review all the GNG inventory. We even use our uh, uh, new global uh, warming potential under the assessment report four. And uh, under the CPIT also we're considering to threaten this capacity for, for the national staff and the line ministries. And even we include some assessment done uh, during the preparation of the project proposal, we include the assessment on the private sector, uh, on each IPCC sector. Uh, now uh, in Tajikistan we have, uh, let's say, the good progress on the private sector that uh, most of the private sectors are considering the issues of the reducing of the emissions. And also the government is considering the public-private partnership on the west side. And uh, we have now seen that the Tajikistan is opening most, uh, a lot of private sectors who are dealing with the waste recycle on, on, on the national level. So hope uh, with the CBIT project, we will raise again the awareness of all the, all the stakeholders in the country, even the private sector will be included in this uh, process. So together with the FAO, maybe we will uh, include new tools and the methodologies for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for showing how you are trying to implement the transparency. Um, I see that it's also possible and turned possible with a lot of co collaboration in CFAO, but you mentioned the NDC partnership. And behind the NDC partnership, you have a, a lot of different partners. Um, this is something I, I guess all countries should be aware. It's a, it's a complex uh, process, uh, and we will turn this possible only if we collaborate all together. And Tajikistan here is a good example of that such a collaboration, FAO, the NDC partnership, an inter interministerial collaboration on all of the stakeholders involved in the process. So thanks for showing that uh, uh, the way forward. Now I, I will call. Uh, Miss Undarma Kurel Batar. I hope my pronunciation is correct. She's a coordinator for the Force National Communication on the second Biuya. I will manage. Binya update report. Let's say like that. It's more simple. Uh, so. Uh, and she's representing the, uh, uh, the country of Mongolia. So please, the, the floor is you to share uh, here also your, your country experience. Thank you. Thank you. So it is my pleasure to attend a side event uh, hosted by the FAO. And um, I'll uh, try to give a glance about uh, what we've been benefited from the global and national CBIT project implementation in Mongolia. So in Mongolia's case, the project was jointly implemented by the Ministry of Environment and Tourism and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations with the funding uh, with the GEF between 2019 and 2020, 2022. And uh, same, similar as the global and the other national projects, the primary objective of this project is is aims to you know the strengthen capacity uh, in the agriculture and forestry and land use sector in Mongolia, and of course uh, we also consider the ETF uh, manners under the NDC uh, implementation uh, under the uh, Paris Agreement of the UNFCCC. So um, on the implementation side, uh, Ministry of Environment and Tourism. Um, appointed the CCRCC as a, as a collaborative unit with this national CBIT project. So let me give you a glance about this uh, organization. So this Climate Change uh, Research and Cooperation Center is a self-funded and state-owned enterprise, but um, it, which this uh, organization ensures the implementation of policies and resolutions uh, by the parliament and government of Mongolia, as well as uh, ensuring the implementation of the um, international treaties and ratified uh, those uh, international resolutions. 
And so under the CCRCC, uh, there is um, uh, this uh, National Communications uh, Supporting Project Unit, uh, which includes the greenhouse gas inventory specialists. So uh, CCRCC members, this uh, inventory experts collaborated with the CBIT project very closely during the implementation of the national project. So I want to mention about those uh, critical highlights under this uh, CBIT project with the collaboration of this uh, greenhouse gas inventory experts. So, um, so the first one is uh, CBIT Mongolia project and the global CBIT project work together to complete the estimation of annual uh, methane emission factors from cattle and yak interfermentation uh, following the tier two method uh, uh, based on the national livestock statistical data. And, um, well, and the greenhouse gas inventory experts and national livestock experts followed the process of uh, this work and supported the preparation of the data uh, for uh, data availability. And um, as a result, national experts gained some knowledge on the calculation and estimation of the emission factors uh, based on the native cattle data. And um, according to the 2014 uh, greenhouse gas inventory results, the um, agriculture sector interfermentation uh, contributes the highest uh, to greenhouse gas emission, uh, which leads to the 57.3% of the uh, net greenhouse gas emissions. And thus, this interfermentation emission factor calculation was uh, played an essential role for shifting the method uh, from tier one to tier two. So uh, the result uh, of this work uh, needs to be validated uh, further by the national experts, uh, by the Min uh, Ministry of Environment and Tourism and uh, Ministry of Food and Agriculture and Light Industry. And also the, the one of the other highlights on the global CBIT project was uh, the technical support was provided to the national project for identifying the needs and gaps and uh, establishing the MNR framework uh, based on the results of assessment and through this um, through the agricultural adaptation monitoring and um, evaluation baselining questionnaire. So this work um, has helped the national experts to understand and identify the need for uh, preparing the adaptation part of the reports. And the last but not least, the uh, national experts in this, um, um, under this uh, project, national projects, uh, has, has attended the, and participated the workshops and trainings through the connection with the national CBIT project. So, um, and additionally, project has tested uh, the BTR roadmap tool, so uh, which was prepared by the Global CBIT project uh, to guide Mongolia, uh, plan the preparation, uh, the process of the BTR, and preparing the roadmap for implementing it. So uh, basically, it's. Um, it uh, created the, the, the pathway uh, for the preparation of the first BTR of Mongolia uh, since we are uh, planning to submit the second biennial update report in, at the end of this uh, year. So it's uh, based on what I mentioned and wrapping up based on the mentioned the highlights, the capacity uh, strengthening is, is a process, is a long, uh, is a process, but this uh, national level project implementation was, you know, one of the pillars to uh, engage the stakeholders and, um, you know, um, continuous collaboration uh, um, establishment. And thank you. Th thank you so much. Uh, it was a very detailed answer where we can see the continuity between all the process that country are already engaged since long on the national communication, and you're already in the first one, then the BUR that were added, and now the next step that has the BTR, 
on all the, the need for capacity building, increase uh, the capacity always in the country, and now you are able to also to have a tier two approach for livestock, which is a sector that is quite still complex to, to, to address. So it was very nice to see all this progress were made, and perhaps here this is a, uh, something to, to learn that the process will be always a little bit complex. Uh, whatever uh, your situation as a country, you need to engage and to start, and basically you cannot, let's say, do all the first step, but you need in implement on step by step, this is a way you will manage to have at the end a full reporting that will be compliant and transparent and representing really your national uh, circumstances. So now perhaps I, I will ask a point of view from Yungo or youth people uh, in that process. Uh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, so we have Elizabeth Gulugulu, she is uh, global focal point once again for Yungo. Um, the question I have for you is can you present what was done on, in a youth perspective so far? Because I guess for most of us it looks like a so complex, difficult uh, process to understand and how Yungo for instance a, a uh, learning from that on basically what you are putting in place as you go on in terms of element that can help young people to understand the, the process and eventually fully be engaged. So, Elizabeth, please. Thank you so much for the platform to speak. Uh, Elizabeth Gulugulu is my name, as Raj fully mentioned. I work for an organization called the African Youth Initiative on Climate Change, which is based in Zimbabwe and also the Global South Focal Point for the Official Children and Youth Constituency in Zimbabwe, uh, which is a, uh, under a process of the UNFCCC. So um, this year I had the privilege to participate uh, in an event that was supported by the FAO, which we tamed uh, as the Academia for Transparency. The reason why we had, or oh, the reason why I particularly participated in this event, and I think the reason why FAO managed to support the institutions in Zimbabwe to come up with this event is because they had identified a gap that was there when it comes to issues to do with transparency, which you all know as Article 13. So in this event, it was used as an event to capacitate and also an awareness building initiative on what transparency is, how the academia sector can come uh, into play and how students can take part into this initiative uh, through uh, researches, making sure that data and information is available. This initiative, uh, it was being led by one of the institutions, but it was not only one, it was a coalition of different universities in Zimbabwe. And you would find that, as you have rightfully mentioned, that this is a very complex and complicated topic. It's not a matter of capacitating the students, but it's also a matter of making sure that the teachers or the lecturers themselves are well capacitated enough so that they can be able to share that information in a more understandable manner to the students so that they will be able to, you know, make use of the information uh, that they have had. We had, you know, quite a number of uh, virtual interventions, uh, virtual exchanges amongst students themselves, and it was a platform where they could ask how best they can continue with these conversations going forward because now the project has ended, but definitely, you know, the ETF has already started, and we need to make sure that they are constantly being involved in this discussion. So from this experience, you see that there is need, even for the different governments, including the government of Zimbabwe, to make sure that there is a, a framework that is put into place which will accommodate uh, transparency to be mainstreamed within the education curriculum uh, of Zimbabwe, but I'm not only referring to Zimbabwe, but maybe this can also be upscaled or replicated in other countries. And one thing that I also underestimated was that for us to have these capacity buildings and awareness, there was need for resources, and there is need for more resources to make sure that, 
even university students, they are quite aware, and also to make sure that we try by all means to break down this information in a manner that they understand. It's quite technical, yes, but I know if we can invest more into making sure that the information is uh, understandable and they can actually make use of the information as we, are also be, as we will also be uh, preparing for the uh, biannual transparency report by 2025, meaning that the students, including young people, they play a very critical role in making sure that data and information is available for this process. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. And very interesting when you said that we need also to do the capacity building with the teacher first. Because if we really want to transfer from one generation to another and have the right uh, capacities and in the future, we need also to, to let's say, upscale the capacity of the own teacher themselves. Because it's a process that is quite rather new for everyone. And you mentioned quite well all the challenges. Perhaps no, we, we, we had different uh, views, so a project that is starting with a lot of, uh, of let's say, working on the building the right collaboration, the interstitial arrangement, uh, and so on. We have seen a project uh, that is moving already from the fourth national communication, second BUR, and now moving toward implementing a pathway for the BTR. Um, the young perspective, so perhaps now I can open for some question from all participants and countries that are facing that challenge in a sector that, uh, as I have said, is quite complex. I can see that, Mirella, you have already a question? Uh, yes, Marcel, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, also because, uh, first of all, I would like also to thanks a lot uh, uh, also uh, Elizabeth, that uh, we are doing a, a, a much broader uh, uh, support uh, for youth on climate change in general. As you see, in fact, uh, you know, we have been working together with the Yungo also for a webinar series that we launched through the Climate Change and Knowledge Hub uh, for empowering youth in agriculture to engage uh, in the UNFCCC and specifically to guide them uh, during the summer at the COP27. So that is uh, something very important. But you was raising one question, how, and also Elizabeth raised that problem, how really start and help the country, the, the, the young people, to understand better what is, uh, is possible to learn on transparency. And, and again, that is a thanks again to the Yungo that provide all the time some feedback during our preparation of the pocket guide for young people and beginners. That is a, a very uh, way to demystify a bit the topic of transparency and help really young people to start in approaching this item. Because what we need actually right now, we need really to build a group of teams of new young people expert on the topic of transparency because they will need really the country to have the, the, the young people in the university to support on this process. So uh, sorry for this intervention, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Mirella, and it's very uh, useful to, um, to see, and thanks to your people, uh, that, that guide. Myself, I learn a lot reading. It's not just for young people, so all people need to learn. So I'm, I'm putting myself on the side sometimes of the beginner. Uh, the process is so complex. So it's very useful to, to have that uh, publication now available for all of us. Uh, Elizabeth, you want to add something on that? Or well, it's fine, I can add the room, up to you. No. Okay, so let, I will take p a question from, from the room. So uh, if, if you can raise your hand, I don't know if we have a roving mic. No one, no question? You are all convinced that transparency in the AFOLU sector is an easy task, although that no, you have all the tools available. Okay. Certainly, uh, this is a topic that will uh, come back uh, again and again because the countries, the first uh, biennial transparency report is due December uh, 2024. Uh, so basically, in two COP. Uh, I'm quite sure that 
Uh, most countries are already engaged on starting the reflection, some are more advanced than others. In 2023, I'm quite sure that a lot of uh, countries uh, will, will, uh, will start to, to say, oh, how oh, we can get prepared to have something ready for end of uh, 2024. On what uh, we can see now on, on the screen, uh, the best way to do that is to have tools, but also a network to connect with uh, experts. Uh, so someone uh, online is asking if we can put all the link. Yeah, we will put all, all the link and also you can reach me. Or we have the FAO pavilion. That way you, we have uh, material available. But uh, on the web page you can see on the screen, Mirella, if you can just zoom a little bit. Uh, uh, so you have a lot of different material, but there is also community of, of, of practice. So you can see the different uh, aspect. So you have a transparency network because nothing better than exchanging among peers to understand the difficulties and to look and to understand how it was possible to solve sometimes some bottleneck. Uh, so what was the solution that were implemented? So you can see here transparency networks, a roster of transparency practitioners uh, working together. So it's how to get uh, in, engaged and to exchange. You have youth and academia. Uh, the example of the countries also. So here, if you go there, you, you will see exactly what uh, the countries. And you can see that uh, a, a lot of uh, pins already on the map where you have CBIT country project. Uh, where you have project uh, pilot, so to, uh, starting with, uh, with a pilot, on where you can see uh, with other organization, uh, so those are project not only uh, FAO, so you can, uh, we are trying to uh, aggregate all the available information. So you can see here there was uh, much uh, information, or you can see the presentation. So I invite all of you uh, to go to that transparency website for the AFODU sector, but can also help a lot in the other sectors. And last but not least, this is part of a global effort, uh, as Mirella was mentioning, we have a climate uh, change uh, knowledge hub where we are trying to put uh, together all the relevant information to tackle the challenge on adaptation, mitigation, transparency, reporting, what we have uh, available, not only from the first side, but also from a lot of other uh, organizations that can bring uh, element to that uh, complex debate. Oh, we have Nicaragua that joined us in the room. So we have a, a chance, a very uh, an interesting chance to learn also from Nicaragua in a different context. So please, if you can join us on the stage. So for Nicaragua, we have Mr. Javier Antonio Gutierrez Ramirez. That is the Vice Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. And he no, no, no problem. We understand the, the agenda of minister, vice minister, are, are very, very complex in a COP with everyone uh, calling you, asking for bilateral. And when you walk in the corridor, you also bump on person that ask you for input. So I, I have a, a question for you, if you can add in, in that debate from Nicaragua. What are the actions that the country is taking to ensure the sustainability of the activities uh, proposed by the CBIT project. So the floor is you. Thank you. I, I apologize for, for being late. Uh, I'm so sorry, but the, the map is location is uh, very complex. So sorry, sorry. I'm be, I very, I very sorry. Uh, the transparency process uh, uh, under uh, uh, 13, art, Article 13 of uh, UNFCC is be, our condition is very complex. It's very complex because uh, to, to uh, we intend uh, to, to address three uh, elements very important. One is uh, uh, capacity building is very important in different level, not only in the in the in the government level, uh, it's not also in the in the territorial level, technical level, 
uh, um, and community also. It's, it's very important to, to, to expand to democratization information at different levels. This is it's the principal topic in transparency uh, process. The second one is a methodology. So what is the methodology? Uh, 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 accuracy, what is the methodology important for, for, for to respond a, a, a requirement a, a, a to GMFCC is the other uh, element uh, uh, of Nicaragua implementing a different uh, project and in particular uh, the, the project of, uh, with, uh, with um, FIAO uh, is it supporting for the, the global environmental facility. Uh, it, it, the second one uh, is, is the is the, uh, the governance and uh, institutional arrangements. This is uh, very important. Uh, we, we have a, a different um, uh, level, forest, uh, environment, uh, rural sector, uh, finance sector. The principal challenge in Nicaragua is, is uh, to, to, to align or to, to, to directional in one, in one goal, all, all institutional around the information methodology and, and, and resolve about the transparency of climate change. Uh, our point of view is that it's very important, it's, it's uh, very complex, it's, we have a, a, another element important, but in principal issues, in principal um, aspect in, in this process is a, a three element I, I, I comment. Thank you very much for, again, so, so sorry for being late. Thank you so much, and it's very important to learn that Institutional arrangements are not only key when you start the project, but also to ensure the sustainability and the long run of the project. So all the exchange with all the different partners, like we have seen for, from uh, Tajikistan, and that are still in place uh, and uh, being reinforced in Mongolia, and in your case, that basically ensures sustainability on the long run to have all people that were involved people, institution, organization involved in the process that turn this sustainable in the mid and the long term. So I, I guess we are running close to the, to the end. So basically what I, I, I will, uh, my conclusion is transparency is a complex uh, issue perhaps repeating myself, we just need to start. We, sh we should not be afraid by the complexity. We can always start perhaps looking at where we have low hanging fruits, what is the sector where we have the expert, the young people that are uh, uh, already uh, ready with uh, full of motivation to be part of that process at country level, but also regional and internationally following the, like here, the, the discussion. So we need really to start. AFOLU, it's perhaps one or the most uh, complex uh, to tackle. Uh, and with all the material that have been already produced by not only FAO, but with all the other partners, the countries, the stakeholders in the countries, building on lesson learned on reality, real issues uh, on, on the ground. Uh, I'm quite sure we can help and support most of the country in that uh, endeavor. So thanks again for all the panelists. I guess they deserve a round of applause. Please join me. So thanks so much. And thanks also for, for you. No. But Mirella, I don't know if you have also a final word to say. You, I know that you were stuck in Rome. You are not here with us in Charmel Cher to see the nice sea that no one can see because it's too far. <laughs> or it's night when you are ending the meetings, so. Now, I, I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the uh, speakers and thank you very much for all the participants for the interest. We are always uh, ready to support the country. So just please get in touch on the website. There is also our connecting link. And I'm pretty sure that we will continue to work on this item in the coming years. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mirella. And, and just to add, uh, as FAO, when we have requests, we try to answer all the requests. And we know also that uh, language barriers is sometimes a, a difficulty. 
So do not hesitate to reach us in French. You can see my English is not perfect. I'm, by, I'm, I'm, I'm francophone, so you can notice. Uh, so we can reach uh, the team. We have uh, francophone people. We have uh, uh, Spanish uh, uh, people uh, speaking Spanish. We have also people uh, speaking Portuguese in the team. So we have uh, uh, Russian also. So basically, we, we can respond to a, a, a any request, trying to 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 fit. The, the response to the, the need of the country partner. Thanks so much. And uh, with that, I guess we will uh, uh, stop here for today. Thank you so much.
1, 2, 1, 2. Uno, dos, uno, dos. Hola, sí. sí. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hello, one, two, three.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your presence here in this meeting and this event called Article 6 Implementation and its Integration to the Enhanced Transparency Framework on Article 13. This event is organized by the Ministry of Environment of Peru and the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency with the support of the Climate Promise Initiative of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Um, Just to, to, to start, I would like to, to uh, re recall the main objectives of this uh, meeting. Uh, the main uh, objective is to raise awareness and increase understanding of linkages and integration between Article 6 and the enhanced transparency and framework of Article 13 of the press agreement, considering NDC implementation, urgency, and ambition. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Oleg Bulandi, Senior Program Manager of ICAT Secretariat. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bulani is Senior Program Manager and coordinates the development and implementation of ICAT strategies and regional and country projects. Oleg brings to ICAT hands of experience in climate finance, MRV, and carbon markets. Prior to ICAT, he managed climate finance, accounting, and reporting at the Euro European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Previously, Oleg developed uh, the carbon market regulatory framework at the UNFCC Secretariat and provide climate change consultancy service in Ukraine. So I would like to invite you to give the opening remarks to this side event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for attending this event. Uh, my name is Oleg Bulani. I'm representing the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency we are happy to partner with uh, Peru to, to host this event because uh, I believe that partnership would bring the, the balance uh, uh, outline of, of country experience and knowledge sharing that we provide in ICAT. So to say a couple of words about ICAT and what we do and what could be useful in the context of Article 6 uh, activities, uh, initiative for Climate Action Transparency is uh, an incorporated partnership that was set up in 2015 and our main mission is to support countries, to empower countries to in uh, setting up frameworks for uh, reporting to UNFCCC under Article 13, so everything related to enhanced transparency frameworks. So we do this by rolling out country projects where we uh, building capacity uh, and create some uh, national institutional arrangements that would help countries to to improve their domestic policy making and report to UNFCCC. And uh, you would might be wondering uh, how it's still with Article 6. So uh, we think that within EU uh, climate change architecture there is a strong link between Article 6 and Article 13. And that's not only uh, embedded in uh, modalities and procedures of Article 13, where uh, those countries who are engaged in, in cooperative approaches under Article 6 should report uh, their activities in DTR. But it's uh, a sort of two-way uh, street where the information that is uh, <coughs> collected and analyzed for purpose of Article 13 also inform the policy makers how to better engage in Article 6 activities. So there are a lot of uh, interchange and links between these two uh, vehicles, I would say. And to, to address the issue of, of uh, better understanding how this uh, could work in an efficient way, we decided to, to develop the guide that explore the uh, connections between requirements of Article 13 and Article 6. And also it uh, shed some light on, on how policymakers could engage in uh, initial discussion of what activities would make sense to, to, to be uh, put on the cooperative approaches under Article 6. This guide will be presented later today in this event. And uh, now I give back floor to our moderator, Manuel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oleg. Thank you very much, Oleg. And in this uh, first part, 
in this event, uh, we want to, we, we will have uh, two speakers. The first one is uh, Milaro Sandoval Diaz, General Director of Climate Change and the Certification in the Ministry of Environment of Peru. Uh, let me introduce uh, briefly uh, Milagros. Milagros, lawyer graduated in environmental law from the uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Peru with a master's degree in conservation of forest resources from the Molina National Agrarian University. She had extensive professional experience in the fields related to natural resources, forestry, and wildlife. He, she, her work experience includes the Office of Supervision of Timber Forest Concession, the Peruvian Society of Environment Law, and her experience as Regional Director of Climate Change in Conservation International. Currently, she is the General Director of Climate Change and the Certification of the Ministry of Environment. Please, uh, Milagros. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and, and thanks uh, again for, for this collaborative effort together with ICAT to move forward in this, in this side event. Um, as mentioned before, what we would like to present is the, the progress we're making and, and the, also the links uh, on between Article 6 and, and 13, and, and especially the implementation of the Paris Agreement in Peru which is definitely something that we are currently doing and it's an ongoing task. And for many countries, it's a learning by doing process because obviously right now here under the UNFCCC, there are still some guidelines to be approved or um, decided. And, and definitely this is, as I mentioned, a work in progress and the idea is to move forward and, and also um, disseminate what we are doing and also learn from the experience of other countries. So next, please. Thank you. As many of you know, Peru also definitely has an NDC. We um, have included both mitigation and adaptation measures in our NDC, including our, our first proposed NDC was submitted in 2016. And uh, later updating 2020. Currently, we are working on a 2050 roadmap that is our long-term strategy, which, is, which establishes um, our uh, carbon neutrality to 2050. So that's the process we're, we're doing now, but specifically on the NDCs, I would like to highlight that on measures related to mitigation, we have 63 measures. The objective or, or the overall goal, goal is to have 40% um, emission reductions by 2030. And obviously the sectors that are comprehended in this process are the ones that you see below, energy, industry, waste, LULUCF, and agriculture. It's important to mention definitely that the most important sector that emits in the country is the LULUCF sector, followed by energy. Next, please. So in Peru, we have currently, since 2018, uh, our climate change law, which establishes the national framework in which we navigate this process. This legislation also has a regulation, and the regulation, it, it's important to highlight that this regulation went through a consultation process under Convention 169 ILO. So this is important because the, it implies that indigenous peoples were also part of the process as well as different stakeholders that move forward on the process. So what we have worked and is the basis of the work we are doing in climate change in Peru is related to promoting an integral climate change management process in which we have three main pillars which includes strengthening uh, of the climate institutions, of the, of the institutions that we have established, of the governance that's part of this process. Also, the implementation of our NDC, as well as monit uh, monitoring both our progress related to adaptation and mitigation measures. This management model uh, is based in the coordination as well as the technical assistance to all stakeholders. The Ministry of Environment, I, is, and um, the way that it has been established by this legislation is, is the Ministry of Environment is the national authority on climate change. 
and in that way gives support and technical assistance to other sectors as well as subnational governments and local governments to move forward with this integral climate change management process. So this process has um, is envisioned to be multi-sectoral, multi-level, and multi-stakeholder. Next, please. In, uh, we would like to focus specifically in the monitoring uh, of our adaptation and mitigation uh, system. So we call it CIMOM. We're trying to use some acronyms that can help people remember, citizens remember the process. And this is the Peruvian system that we're working on to monitoring climate uh, change action and is, in other words, is the enhanced uh, transparency framework for the Paris Agreement, which we have called it this system. Um, this system has three main components, as you can see, an adaptation component, a finance component, but let me just focus on the mitigation component. The mitigation component is composed of five tools for MRV, for monitoring, um, as, and these include our greenhouse gas inventory, which is nested or it's included in, a, in, in an institutional arrangement that's called the Info Carbono, where different stakeholders and different sectors that are part of this process um, are link their information and work on their information. And based on this, we have our greenhouse gas in national inventory. There is also the carbon footprint, or in Spanish, as we call it, huella de carbono, which is a voluntary tool in which we have seen a lot of interest by different actors, especially by the private sector. And nowadays, we have at least 1,000 companies and, or other institutions, both public and private, that are um, registered in this, in this program. And actually, right now, at least more, or more than 400 organizations are measuring their carbon emissions, which is definitely interesting because there is a, a need or an appetite from the private sector to start uh, doing climate actions in order to also be considered under uh, the Peruvian legislation. Also, uh, and more specifically, we have also, um, uh, among the other uh, tools that we have, I would like to highlight the National Mitigation Measures Registry. This registry is mainly focused on identifying how we move forward on the process related to uh, monitoring and measuring our progress re related to the mitigation component of our NDC. Next, please. So this National Mitigation Measures Registry, which we call RENAMI, and if you are also, um, we, we're, as I mentioned, we're trying to work on acronyms that make it uh, easier for people to remember. This registry has three main um, components, or three main ideas or goals. The first one is to register, as, as, a registry, as a registry is to register mitigation measures implemented in the country. The second one is related to report. To report the progress of implementation of the mitigation measures uh, to all the citizens or to all, any stakeholder that is interested in knowing what the measures, what are the measures, what's the progress made, among other information that will be, um, that will be included in the registry. And also um, the third component, and that definitely is very linked to the work that we're doing under Article 6 here in, under the UNFCCC that is, that is related to authorizing the transference of emission reductions or carbon credits. So this is, and, and this is mainly, this registry is hosted in the Ministry of Environment of Peru. Obviously, it is linked with other sectors as well as other stakeholders, but the idea is that um, right now, we are working or we have worked on a specific uh, regulation that is going to establish the, all the components necessary for any stakeholder interested in registering the, their measures under this registry. Currently, we have uh, put this um, regulation in uh, for public consultation 
we finalized the public con consultation around one month ago, so we're currently reviewing the comments. We have more than 600 comments received, not only from different actors, but I want to highlight that also from indigenous peoples, where we are doing a very uh, work related to capacity building and technical assistance, so that this is clear and that we can give clarity as well as legal security, including the support of safeguards to promote this process. So this national uh, registry is going to support both, as you can see in your screens, uh, the monitoring and reporting of Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement, as well as monitoring the implementation of mitigation measures for NDC achievement that is based on what has been um, approved in Article 13. So this is the process and the links and, and currently what we have been uh, doing related to the registry. Next, please. So around the linkages between Article 6 uh, related to cooperative approaches and Article 13 and the enhanced transparency framework, this is uh, this decision, uh, 18 CMA.1, that relates to this process is the one that is going to explain um, how these linkages are being established, and as I mentioned, this at a national level, because we have the UNFCCC process, but the idea is that how in different countries this is going to land at, the, uh, at specific regulations. So we have this specifically, as I mentioned, in the registry of this is what we have to um, report, and this is based on the decision that we can see in the screen. And in the next uh, slide, we can see that this is mainly the how, no? And this was decided last in the last COP, specifically the, uh, related to how this guidance of the operation, of opera implementing the modalities, procedures, and guidelines for the enhanced transparency framework referred to in Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. So mainly this information will also be reflected in our BTRs and specifically on the process that we will be moving forward and reflected both in the registry that I just mentioned as well as the system that is, that, that is part of this overall process that we hope to finalize next year. Next, please. So some of the challenges that we're facing and some of the work that we're doing, obviously, as this is a work in progress and there is no definitely one avenue in which to navigate, uh, and obviously countries have to establish this work based also in their legal systems, um, this is a process that is ongoing and that gives us a lot of uh, interesting um, information as well as lessons learned related to this process. But on specific challenges, I think we want to highlight uh, four that are related to it, the integration of cooperative approaches in the monitoring of the country's NDC. How do you link this with the NDC? How do you know what's inside and what is outside of the NDC? And this is a process that, and decisions that have to be made uh, throughout the, the country and together with the sectors and also with different stakeholders to identify the low hanging fruit from the not so long uh, hanging fruit as well as to how to link all this process and the systems in place. Also, another uh, issue I would like to highlight is related to the systems and this infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the registry proposed in a consultation process. We hope to have the procedure specifically in place and which will give this legal security to different stakeholders. But one of the challenges that we want and, and we want to move forward uh, fast is the total um, functionality, the operationalization of this process. So, so this is definitely something that we hope to finalize during the next week, uh, during the next year, but definitely this is an ongoing process. Uh, capacity building is always, always an issue that is necessary and that is part of this process. Most of the people that come to the UNFCCC understand 
uh, this process, Article 6, the Paris Agreement, but this is not the same in overall for those that don't necessarily work on this process on a day-to-day -day basis. So definitely capacity building is something that's definitely necessary and that is part of the work that we have to do as um, the National Authority on Climate Change. This, this definitely is part of what we want to move forward and we are, um, we are also moving with specific um, specific uh, documents that can help understand different stakeholders. And obviously the fifth but not the last uh, in importance is the financial sustainability of this process. I know that different countries are discussing this currently of how do you operationalize, how do you sustain, how do you make this sustainable specifically because, because these are procedures that governments are going to have to do and we need to see how this is financed uh, or funded uh, through different ways. So these are the uh, four challenges I wanted to share with you and I think that this is all my presentation. Next please. Thank you very much. Thank you Milagros. Um, absolutely interesting to, to, to have this um, presentation to share the experience uh, from a developing country of, of how uh, countries moving forward to uh, develop the enabling conditions to ensure the environmental integrity and transparency uh, re related to the NDC implementation and of course the cooperative approaches. So in this regard, I would like to introduce our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Miguel Rescalvo. Miguel Rescalvo is a, a managing partner from Nagin Consulting. Uh, Miguel has more than 18 years of international experience leading the improvement of growth of business in the energy, climate, and environment sectors. He uh, has successfully managed operations in Europe, Latin America, USA, and China, which has provided him with a broad exposure to global operations and, and cultures. So, um, also Nagin Consulting has developed the ICAT guide on linking uh, Article 6 to the uh, Enhanced Transparency Framework of Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. So I want to, to give the, the floor to, to Miguel, who, who is in um, on remote. Uh, please, Miguel. Thank you, Manuel. Just to confirm that you can all hear me and maybe see me. Is that okay? Good. Um, so I shared some slides that we could use during my presentation. I don't know if you can see them now or should I uh, present them directly? Just one, one minute, I think uh, we had some technical issues. Should I try to share them directly myself? Okay, maybe we can go ahead with all the slides, right? It may not be as easy as using the slides, but we can give it a try. Let me try to share my desktop uh, now, and if that doesn't work. Okay, can you see it? Uh, Miguel, oh, Miguel you, you can actually share your screen if you have slides open. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? No, I'm sorry. I, I, we can't. Okay, so what about not using the screen? No, no, so no, 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 let me... 
It's going to be shared from here, I think. Just one minute. Okay, so it's only a few minutes, right? So I'm, I'm sure we can. Uh, Milagros did a good introduction of the linkage between um, Article 6 and 13, so I can explain um, what, how the guide is structured and the main topics that we discuss in it. Um, okay, I can see now the first slide. Hopefully, you can see it too. So, first of all, let me say first thank you to the Ministry of Environment of Peru for, and ICAT for organizing this event and uh, to ICAT for inviting me. As it was already mentioned, uh, we have helped ICAT to develop a guide on the linkage between Article 6 and 13, specifically uh, the importance of transparency as a key building block for advancing Article 6 oper operationalization. Uh, the guidebook link uh, focuses on the interface between Article 6 and the Enhanced Transparency Framework under Article 6, 13, and is structuring five different sections. First of all, um, it introduces the Paris Agreement um, to go then deeper on the description of the different uh, cooperation alternatives under Article 6. It also um, describes those uh, aiming at policymakers, those key decisions they need to make towards the participation in Article 6, different approaches. And a fourth section goes deeper in this linkage between transparency and Article 6, uh, specifically transparency in the Paris Agreement carbon markets. And the final section gives a more detailed background on Article 16. Next slide, please. So, the guide is, uh, highlights the Paris Agreement bottom-up approach and uh, provides an overview of the importance of this paradigm shift in how um, uh, the international effort toward climate change uh, are working and will work in the future. This is a very different approach to the top-down approach under the Kyoto Protocol, where most, if not all, was under the command and control of UNFCCC. The guide introduces the ambition cycle and that requires countries to report national climate action through their NDCs periodically. And then provide and the need to um, understand what different countries are doing for the, towards the implementation of those NDCs to ensure that this ambition cycle uh, takes us to the uh, desired outcome. Article 6, as you will all know, promote voluntary cooperation in the implementation of this NDC to allow for higher ambition in the mitigation and adaptation actions of countries, at the same time that we promote sustainable development and environmental integrity. It's important to focus here, uh, on, to say here that the focus, as you see, is in higher ambition and that the type of cooperation is not defined. The guide then uh, elaborates on the alternatives approaches that Article 6 introduces, both market approaches under Article 6.2 and 6.4, and non-market approaches under Article 6.8. Next, please. The connection then, as also was mentioned before, between, yeah, maybe we can move to the next slide. Okay, while that happens, I would say that the connection then between the ETF and Article 6 is <clears throat> rationalized through two uh, key reporting needs, one of the GAG inventory and also the need to track progress towards the NDC. Again, it's important to highlight that the ETF and the Article 6 are clearly connected through the NDCs, making critical to understand how each country is performing in the NDC implementation for two reasons. One, as I said before, to 
um, understand how far along we are from the final goal of the Paris Agreement implementation, but also to build trust among the parties willing to cooperate with each other in what each party is doing. The ETF provisions on reporting provides then, or aim at providing confidence in the transparency, accuracy, and level of conservativeness of NDC targets, baselines of reference points and trajectories, the NDC implementation status, and the international transactions that are happening. As said before, also by Milagros, I think Article uh, 13 and the ETF introduces a specific reporting requirements for parties participating in Article 6 that are explained and elaborated in detail in the guide. And even if you can't see that in the screen, or at least I don't see that slide, um, these specific Article 6 reporting requirements refer to the initial reports, um, a specific information that is to be provided through the BNL transparency report and annual uh, registry information to be submitted to the future young FCCC Article 6 database. In the case of Article 6.4, it also requires specific information to be provided to the supervisory body. It's important to mention, and you can uh, see that in uh, Chapter 4 of the Section 4 of the Guide, that all of these reporting efforts will require additional capacity in countries, already mentioned by Milagros. It's important also to highlight, and it is so explained in the guide, that there is no differentiation between the reporting requirements for developed and developing countries, even when Article 13 provides flexibility in how that happens. Therefore, countries need to advance on the design and implementation of institutional capacities and regulatory frameworks to participate in Article 6, to track NDCs and comply with the reporting requirements. Uh, if you can, I don't know if you can advance the slide, but I need the last one um, say, to say that uh, there's a specific section in the guide that explains um, the, the decisions that the country needs to make to participate in Article 6 and the <clears throat> new role and the implications of this participation. First, important to say that there is a new role for developing countries participating in uh, Article 6, specifically Article 6 approaches focus on markets, 6.2 and 6.4, because as you well know, the transaction of IDMOS between parties assisting each other in achieving their NDCs and higher ambition implies a corresponding adjustment to avoid double counting or those transactions to be double counted. And this new role of developing countries has several implications when it comes to understanding where the country is in the implementation of the NDC, uh, what are the conditions for those cooperations, and which are the mitigation actions that need to be implemented domestically and can be implemented domestically, and which are the, the uh, mitigation and adaptation actions that they need support with. Yeah, we were in the previous one, thank you. So this is very timely to see this here as a conclusion. So the guide in the policy consideration sections explain that there are plenty of opportunities for countries to cooperate through Article 6. These opportunities are linked to the need to, the, to mobilizing financial resources towards high ambition climate actions, at the same time promoting technology transfer and projects that the country would not implement itself, and also being able to structure through those Article 6 agreements, but as already done under the Article 6.4 uh, mechanism, a specific financing options for adaptation and other mitigation, uh, domestic mitigation actions, establishing the need of share of proceeds in the 
agreement among countries. The same can be done as a new opportunity to also contribute through, in this case, the, co the cooperative approaches under Article 6.2 to overall mitigation of global GHG emissions, as it's already uh, stated for Article 6.4. The participation on um, Article 6 also implies some risks that countries need to understand, and we explain that in our guides. There is obviously the, the risk that needs to be managed to understand that we are not transferring uh, mitigation outcomes that the country needs to achieve the NDC domestically. As already mentioned, the managing the risk of double counting is important, and preserving environmental integrity, not only at the country level, through the implementation of the ETF, but also environmental integrity at the activity level. To understand what are the provisions in place to ensure that IDMOS that are transferred are real, verifiable, and additional. There are some implementation costs for countries to develop the institutional and regulatory uh, frameworks that I mentioned before. Also, the infrastructure that Milagro uh, referred to before, like registry and others, that will uh, imply the use of resources, human resources, and also technologies that has a cost and that the country needs to ensure that are properly covered through <clears throat> the administrative fees and other um, support obtained to personalize Article 6. As a conclusion, I would say that uh, when uh, addressing these opportunities and risk, the guide tried to explain that all of these are aspects that need to be considered when specifically Article 6.2 agreements for cooperative approaches are put in place among parties, helping each other to achieve the MDC towards higher ambition. There are already some countries that are front runners uh, in this process, some of them present in the room, both from uh, the donor side and, and the implementation side. And it's important to understand the lesson learned from them and also how to mitigate some of the risks. And we try to explain in uh, this guidebook how to do that. With this, sorry for the, uh, these technology glitches. I hope that you could follow more or less my explanation without all the uh, slides there. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Sorry. Thank you, Miguel. Um, well, now we, uh, I, I would like to introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, I, I want to introduce uh, Veronica Elgar. Veronica Elgar is uh, join us uh, in remote mode. Veronica is the beauty head of international climate policy and head of bilateral climate agreements at the Swiss Federal Office of, for the Environment. In this role, Veronica Elgar has established Switzerland's bilateral Article 6 agreement, which pioneered the international transfer of mitigation outcomes at the standards of the Paris Agreement. And also, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Benedict Chia. Benedict is uh, director, general director of climate change from the National Climate Change Secretariat in the Prime Minister Office of Singapore. Uh, prior to joining NCCS, Benedict worked on climate, sustainability, and energy in various government agencies, such as the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Trade and Industry, as well as the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources. Benedict has been actively involved in carbon markets work. He was the vice chair of the ECAO Technical Advisory Body, between other, other uh, um, appointments. So, uh, first of all, I would like to start with uh, my first question. Um, for Veronica, if Veronica do can hear us, <laughs> my this uh, my first question is: uh, How the enhanced transparency framework contribute to ensure ambition and environmental integrity in the application of cooperative approaches? Thank you very much, and good afternoon to the COP. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to join this panel um, together with uh, all the partners, but our distinguished and well-established pioneering partner, Peru, on Article 6. Much appreciated. And first and foremost, let me congratulate Peru for the preparations of the national framework 
for transparency and also Article 6 activities. This we consider is absolutely key to maximize ambition of Article 6 activities and to maximize the benefits of carbon markets for the host country. And I think I'm echoing the previous speakers here. Um, and also, thank you very much to ICAP for the work ongoing. I think this is equally very helpful um, globally. Let me unpack a little bit from our perspective why we consider such national frameworks to be key. Enhanced national frameworks and the transparency bit is an important component in this. Allow from our uh, experience, what we've learned so far, a strategic use for international carbon markets by the host countries. The host country can take informed decisions, can guide carbon finance into sectors and activities that are most beneficial to its economy and society. Synergies can be established between domestic climate action and carbon finance, and thereby enhancing the climate effect of the activities. Uh, and that, in fact, is not just in the interest of the host countries, but in our view, it's beneficial for the global climate and therefore also much appreciated from cooperating countries like Switzerland. So that's very much why we appreciate uh, Peru's engagement here in the enhanced transparency framework. We consider it's key uh, and glad to see that happen. It is the basis um, for informed decision making and it is a driver for ambition. It also, from our view, uh, ensures integrity in the implementation of Article 6. So not just a decision how to engage, but also during implementation itself. The Paris Agreement uh, very clearly sets up the spirit that each uh, mitigation outcome, each ITMO, is only counted once. And the Enhanced Transparency Framework provides uh, the necessary transparency, the necessary tracking to implement this. It also, in the connection with all mitigation activities ongoing, uh, enables the host country to have a full overview of all mitigation activities for achieving NDC um, and beyond. And that only, it only helps to detect any potential double counting. It also makes any double claiming evident, which then can be addressed again to the benefit of the climate. So that is why I fully echo the previous speakers on the necessity and the the benefit, the potential of connecting Article 6 activities in a national framework with all climate action. And we are very glad to see Peru again pioneering such national frameworks and sharing their experience and lessons learned here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronica. So my second question is uh, for Benedict. How do you see transparency benefiting participating countries as well as the carbon market in general? What role can transparency play? Um, well, uh, thanks so much, Manuel, for the question. I think I want to start by first thanking uh, the Ministry of Environment from Peru for uh, inviting us to sit on this panel and to share our views. Uh, maybe to start off, as background, um, we have been exploring Article 6 uh, collaborations with Peru and uh, many of the things that I'm sharing also is being driven from the experience actually through this exploration process. Um, so in terms of the question of um, how does, what's the link between transparency uh, and, and carbon markets activity, Article 13 and Article 16, right? I, maybe our starting point would be what are some of the outcomes that we hope to achieve from market collaborations itself. And one of the first outcomes and probably one of the more important outcomes is uh, we see collaborative approaches under Article 6 as being a means to raise ambition overall. And uh, transparency plays a critical part in that, uh, in, in, in this effort to increase ambition. And I think as Milagros has shown in her slides that she presented earlier, um, uh, by actually laying out very clearly uh, through a transparent manner, what are the activities that lies within the NDC and what are the activities that lies above the NDC? It allows 6.2 activity to be channeled towards those that lies above NDC. And this ensures that whatever we do on uh, Article 6 actually helps to enhance the overall ambition. You really want to avoid a situation where you're doing 6.2 within for activities within NDC itself. 
Um, the second area which we, we feel is very important about all our collaborations is the need for uh, local community benefits. Uh, sustainable development goals to be met within the host country itself. And again, uh, by taking, by ensuring that there's transparency on the sustainable development benefits that result as, a, as, as an outcome of the uh, Article 6 collaborations, it incentivizes uh, project developers, it incentivizes the private sector uh, to try to maximize these benefits as far as possible. Uh, the market so far has been fairly responsive. I mean, from our experience, we noticed that uh, projects that have significant uh, sustainable development benefits, those whose sustainable development benefits are even third-party verified, generally tend to command a price premium uh, in, within the carbon markets itself. And this aspect of transparency is critical because if you look back as to how um, carbon markets has worked in the past, there have been examples of projects which actually don't benefit uh, the local community at all. It only benefits uh, the project developer and, 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 and the investor that's channeling resources into it. And this is something that we should avoid. And the fact that um, the, the Article 6 rules require transparency um, on the sustainable development benefits, I, I think it's critical to addressing this concern. Um, the last area in which I, I think we, we hope to see significant benefits from our collaborations is on um, um, crowding in investments. And if you go back to um, one of the key Article 6 principles, it's about additionality. And additionality essentially means that um, um, the economic viability of the project would be affected if you don't have the carbon credit stream itself. And again, on a um, national basis, by being transparent in terms of what sort of activities you're doing on Article 6, actually, it's a very clear signal to potential investors out there, which are the areas which could potentially be additional, which are the areas that, would, um, that, that you could actually crowd in investments. And I think it lays a very strong basis for um, um, uh, additional uh, efforts into such, uh, such, such collaborative approaches itself. Uh, overall, I, I would say transparency is actually, if you take a step back, it's critical to actually providing assurance that um, the outcomes and the goals are actually being met. Uh, carbon markets has not had a very positive um, uh, reputation. Um, there have been criticisms of greenwashing, and, and I would have to admit that in the past, if you look at some of the activities, I, I would say that it's, it's probably guilty as charged. Uh. But going forward <coughs> with the Article 6 framework, with the Article 13 framework, I think it gives us an opportunity um, to, to put in place a system that um, builds on what we have previously and to demonstrate and to this signal to, to the rest of the world that um, uh, activities that take place under Article 6 are credible um, uh, and are a legitimate way for various countries to, to meet their uh, emissions goals while um, uh, helping to advance overall um, uh, uh, ambition on climate itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benedict. Well, um, I would like to, 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 to thank for our uh, panelists and, and speakers um, for the closing of this side event. I want to invite uh, for the closing remarks uh, Ms. Catherine Diombala uh, from, uh, from the Climate Change uh, Unit of the UNDP. Uh, please, Catherine. Catherine um, is a climate change technical specialist from the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Catherine provides a strategic guidance of the UNDP offer of national determined contributions and support several countries to put in place policies, strategies, and coordination mechanisms that facilitate NDC implementation. So thank you, Catherine. I give you the floor. This is working. OK. I see you have a better view from here with all the screens. and. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks again, Miguel, for, for having us. Um, this this uh, session is, um, covers two topics that are really um, close to our heart and um, that uh, are a, a backbone of the success of the Paris Agre Agreement. 
combining Article 6, which is right now uh, one of the most um, uh, interesting topic uh, in, the, in the COP, you know, behind loss and damage, of course. If you look, look around, you'll see that all the session on Article 6 are fully packed. Everybody is interested. Everybody wants to talk about carbon markets in general and Article 6 in particular. So this session really uh, brings together two specific areas that UNDP is uh, also uh, thinking about and working on. And uh, we are so proud to be um, a longtime partner of the government of Peru. We have worked with Peru on the NDCs, the first one, the second one, on the RENAMI, on the GHG inventory, on the uh, long-term strategy. So uh, really happy to be a uh, part of this effort. But what makes it so exciting is that uh, Peru has always been a pioneer in uh, the climate change work that uh, UNDP is supporting. And it's again showing uh, leadership in this area. Uh, so many countries that we work with uh, want to learn from what you are doing. So really, really happy to, um, to be part of this process and also working with ICAT and uh, I, I, I think Miguel uh, is also uh, going to be supporting another country in, I think, Cote d'Ivoire. So it's, it's good to have this uh, experience from Peru, exchanges with the countries, because we are all asking ourselves the same question. We are all facing the same um, challenges with these new processes that are not fully clarified by the UNFCCC uh, processes. So always happy to see that some countries are taking the leadership and uh, other countries can learn from them. And as UNDP um, and the Climate Promise, we are proud to be behind this. And um, thanks again and congratulations to Peru. And um, I wish you all a successful COP. Thank you.
Good, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone has had a fruitful and successful second day of the Capacity Building Hub. My name is Jairo Agopian, and I am a member of the Paris Committee on Capacity Building. The focus of today's events has been capacity building efforts for implementing the Paris Agreement with special emphasis on Article 6 and 13. As our Executive Secretary, Mr. Simon Steele, highlighted in the opening ceremony of COP on Sunday, the focus of this year's conference in, is on implementation. Today, we have learned from the experiences, knowledge, and practices of organizations who are making strides in the implementation of the Paris Agreement. The importance of transparency ha has also been emphasized throughout the day's events. For example, the UNCCC transparency team highlighted the importance of the media in communicating transparency and how transparency can ultimately make capacity building efforts for developing countries for more effective while also holding parties accountable through enhanced monitoring and reporting. Organizations like GIZ, WMWK, BMWK, sorry, also shared their knowledge and experiences on best practices for technical capacity building efforts in carbon pricing for implementing Article 6 of the Paris Agreement and stress the importance for individual level capacity building through internships and training programs. Likewise, GGI, GGI's experiences in implementing MRV systems in countries like Burkina Faso have been successful through their focus on country ownership and gender mainstreaming. We cannot forget the, about the importance of youth when building capacities, particularly in technical energy transitions, which was highlighted by an interesting range of speakers for the Commonwealth Secretary's event. FAO and Yungo came together to emphasize the importance of transparency in land use and agriculture by sharing country level experiences, particularly by building capacities for youth. We have also had the Government of Peru and the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency, which collaborated to present the importance of developing solid national, national regulation to implement Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Before I hand it over to GGI for a more detailed overview, I want to quickly recall what the party Paris Agri Committee on Capacity Building is and does. Established at COP21 in 2015, the PCCB seeks to address current and emerging gaps and needs in implementing and further enhancing capacity building in developing countries. To support the PCCB's mission and mandate, the committee launched the PCCB network in 2020 as a voluntary association of interested stakeholders engaged in climate-related capacity building. The PCCB regularly mobilizes the expertise of its network members at the regional level through PCCB side events, at the UNFCCC Regional Climate Weeks, through regular webinars and events throughout the year, but also at the international level through capacity building hub at, at COPS. The Capacity Building Hub is a mandated event of the PCCB. It takes place each year at COP with this year at the four hub to take place. Its objective ultimately is to showcase the variety of capacity building efforts which have taken place over the year by sharing information, experiences, and technical capacities to further climate action on a larger scale. To learn more about the PCCB and this network, make sure to check out the two banners with QR codes with the, with that will redirect you to our web pages, which will give you more information. But for now, now over to GGI to give us overview of all that we heard today. Please. Thank you very much, Jairo. Um, yeah, so again, on behalf of the Global Green Growth Institute, uh, it's an honor to have the privilege to wrap up the day, which is no easy task because of the wealth uh, and richness of the discussions through these uh, six sessions that we've uh, heard. Um, my name is Ingvild Solvang. I'm head of climate action and inclusive development at GDGI. And I first and foremost wish to thank my colleagues who have followed the sessions online, particularly Siddhartha Nauri, who is our global MRV lead. Um, and magically, we are here now informed by notes that have also appeared through the day. So there has been a tremendous effort put into this, the, the sessions, but also in the follow-up of the sessions from all the session leads to put key messages together, which in and of themselves will form a part of 
an important outcome of the week focused on capacity building here with the PCCB. So uh, I think uh, Jairo did a great job summarizing uh, the day. Uh, maybe perhaps touch upon a couple of, of additional points and additional details, uh, starting with the first session of the day, which was the UNFCCC focus on the importance of capacity by media. Uh, the role of the media in ensuring transparency, reporting, sharing reporting on uh, climate action and progress with the general public in order to raise political accountability, political will, and public demand for ambitious climate action cannot be underrated. I think that was really concluded in that session. However, it is a difficult role of media to report on something that sometimes appear very technical and to translate the technical reports of UNFCCC and other international and national and local stakeholders and institutions into a language that people understand in an environment that in some areas uh, is shaped and framed by uh, political tension, conflict, war, violence against uh, an, uh, environmentalists um, and so forth. Also, it was brought up the issue of fake news um, and how to effectively communicate in the context of post-truth uh, realities, um, which uh, we know is a risk also to ambitious climate action. So I think that was a great session, and please, for all journalists out there, take a look at the recording and the report from that session. Um, we heard from GIZ, as was mentioned, the experience uh, of building capacity specifically linked to carbon markets and the, the various um, stakeholders involved in that, but with a particular focus on young students and youth. Uh, we heard from, uh, um, uh, from, from uh, storytellers, they call them in the, in the panel, who discuss their concrete experience of, of being given opportunities to excel and advance uh, at a very young age, age, perhaps even before you have any experience, institutions like ours uh, are providing opportunities to you, to you to build that required experience for people to, to excel in their careers in climate action, particularly in this uh, German-funded SPARC um, SPAR 6C, SPARC project uh, focused on capacity building and, and carbon finance. Um, similarly, GGDI focused on the various uh, uh, stakeholders and need for capacity building and urgently need for capacity building in order, order to uphold that cycle under the Paris Agreement for reporting. Uh, so that was highlighted through various um, MRV uh, transparency related projects in Ethiopia, in uh, Burkina Faso, and Uzbekistan in uh, GDGI. Uh, we saw CSETs focused on youth. Um, again, uh, very happy to see that several of the sessions today have been about engaging youth um, and uh, the links to high higher ambitions and youth involvement was particularly highlighted in that, se in that session. Um, the FAO um, shared their experience on knowledge and created tools for transparency implementation and made sure that we all learn where we can access these transparency MRV related tool in the AFOLO sector. Um, and Last but not least, we heard the front-running experiences that have been um, uh, generated lessons for us in Peru. Peru, it was said, has been a front-runner. Uh, it is certainly a front-runner also in terms of GDDI's programs. Um, so it was great to hear um, th the uh, public, private, community, multiple stakeholder engagements in the efforts in Peru uh, linked to Article 6 and, and uh, uh, market, uh, market mechanisms. So all in all, uh, I think we can conclude that today has been perhaps 
the most important day <laughs> of <laughs> the week, which we may say every day. Um, but uh, it was really important. I think somebody said that, you know, uh, Mark, Article 6 was really hot at COP26. It certainly is very, very hot topic here at uh, COP27 as well, alongside, of course, loss and damage and a few other things. But Article 6 keeps drawing the audience. Uh, and as we have showcased today, there is no Article 6. There, there are no market mechanisms without MRV. So that's how I also think it was very good for us to have these two articles and capacity building efforts linked to those two articles together in one, one, in one day so that we highlight also the, the fact that transparency efforts is really the backbone of achieving ambitious climate action, uh, both for mitigation and adaptation, and then particularly if we do want to engage in uh, its more transactions under Article 6, for example, MRV is, of course, really essential. So with that, I wish on behalf of DDDI to thank the PCCB for the collaboration today. Also thank all the session owners and uh, panelists and speakers and the audience um, for joining us today. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much for sharing overview of today's program. Um, so uh, last but not least, um, I would like to give you overview of the third day. So the third day of the hub will be taking place tomorrow under the theme of just trans transition and sustainable economies day. A topic uh, closely aligned with, the, uh, with this year's focus area of the C PCCB, and I hope to see you all there. The, uh, the lead partners, the International La Labor Organization and the World Resources Institute, together with other organizations, will deliver e events which will explore capacity building efforts for a just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies, so make sure you stop by and join the sessions. I would like to once again give a heartfelt thanks to our lead organizer, organizer for today, the Global Green Grow Institute, for their efforts in planning and presenting today's events. Thank you all for being here and have a good evening.